Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Jan Gonzalez. I am a community education um, supervisor in with uh, the University of California Cooperative Extension um, based in the San Diego office. Um, we're very thankful and glad that you are here with us. I'm going to be um, moderating or facilitating the event this afternoon, but I did want to introduce a couple of others who are working behind the scenes. We have um, Robert Padilla. Rob is um, our technical assistant, so he'll be with us probably for the first 30, 40, 60 minutes. Um, if you're having any technical difficulties, please contact him. Um, we'll see if we can get his contact information in the um, chat box. Also, um, we have Heidi Holmquist. Uh, she's a community education specialist with the San Diego office as well. And um, she's pretty much been the organizer of this event and uh, coordinating everything. And she'll be um, kind of monitoring the, the Q&A box and the chat box. So we do want to let you know that um, um, if you have questions, um, if there's time after each presenter, uh, we will allow a few questions. Otherwise, we will hold them till the end of the webinar. Um, so if you have questions, go ahead and type them in the Q&A box. Um, otherwise, um, you know, you can you can put comments or general um, references or whatnots in the chat room. Um, but Q&A for the speakers, please put in the Q&A box. Um, we do want to let you know that there are approved um, continuing education units available um, from the Department of Pesticide Regulations, DPR, as you see on the screen there. Three um, hours have been approved, um, 0.5 or half an hour um, is for laws and regs, and the other 2.5 for other. We also received um, approval from the Western Chapter of International Society of Arboriculture, um, a total of uh, three hours of continuing education. So if you um, are interested in receiving continuing education credit, <laughs> um, course credit, then um, there will be a quiz for that. And the link will be posted in the chat box at the end of the webinar. And so you'll need to click on that link and take the quiz. Um, it's required that um, our records show that you have attended the webinar for at least 80% of the time and that um, you get a score of 70% minimum on the quiz. Um, if you need or would like to retake the quiz, that option will be available to you. Um, you can contact Heidi about that if necessary. Um, and so we'll be verifying all this information and forwarding the information um, to the appropriate organization um, on to receive your continuing education units. Um, also, certificates of verification or certificates of participation will be emailed to everyone um, probably within a week or two. Um, I did want to point out, if I didn't mention this already, that we are recording this session, so it will be accessible um, probably in, in a couple of weeks after the video is downloaded and processed. And I don't know if there's anything else. Heidi, was there anything else that I need to, did I forget any announcements? No, I think that's it. Okay, it's great. <laughs> well, again, thank you everyone for being here. We really appreciate um, the lineup we have today, all of our um, presenters. We're going to kick off um, with the uh, discussion about invasive shot hole bores, Fusarium dieback disease, John Kabashima is the Environmental Horticulture Advisor Emeritus. We do um, have a beginning poll, actually. Oh, that's um, right. Excuse me. We have an I'm open sorry, open. John. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> One really quick poll. So I'm about to launch this poll. Um, and you, we're going to let you guys have like 30 seconds, and then we'll display the results. And I've just launched it about Thank how you. many workshops, webinars, or field trainings um, or more have you, uh, yeah, sorry, about in, of the insect pest features in today's webinar have you previously attended? We'll be covering ISHB, GSOB, SAPW, ACP, and Mexican fruit fly. 
So we're just curious to know um, how much training you've had on these subject matters. Today's webinar is about updates. Um, so we please go ahead and select. Okay. All right, I'm gonna share the results real quick. Okay, so average two to three. We've got a few first timers. Thank you for joining us. Um, if there's some information that's not covered, um, there will be links, um, information shared with how you can get more information on some of them basic. Thank you for that. Everyone. Thank you for reminding me, Heidi. I'd forgotten about that poll. Okay, back to John. Um, he is the uh, um, our first speaker. And he is an emeritus advisor from UC Cooperative Extension, Orange County. Okay. Thank you, John, for your patience. So the invasive shot hole bore uh, Fusarium dieback complex is a current problem started um, about 2012, really. But uh, 2002 was the first time we found it. Let's see if I can. <clears throat> so we have a problem out there with all the invasives. And that's what uh, Bea Nabua Berman calls the four stages of bad management. The thing that we're constantly running into is denial. So when we try to go out and educate people about this, the common answer we get is, hey, I don't have a problem. My trees aren't dying. And they're, they're probably thinking, we're making all this up. And I, and I do that sometimes, but not this time. So then get anger once they have their trees being attacked. And they say, my trees are declining and dying. Why didn't anyone tell me about this? And that's why I'm glad you're on this, this webinar, because we're telling you about it. And we have your names. So if you tell us we didn't tell you about it, um, too bad. So bargaining. Uh, one thing that we see commonly is once they have a big infestation, their trees are being infested, they panic and they start using tons of pesticides. That seems to be everybody's first response. And it doesn't work. And we've, we've seen this time and time again. And then the last one is uh, our trees are dying and there's nothing we can do. But there actually is something you can do, and that's to use IPM, Integrated Pest Management. We're going to be using science-based decision-making based on science and research that have been uh, com conducted in the last few years. They, it combines a variety of techniques. We're looking at basic science that studied the life cycle and how the pest and the fungus interact with the environment. We have some of that information now. And our goal is to improve the management, lower your cost of controlling it, and then obviously reducing the risk to people and the environment. So the IPM approach here is to identify the pest and disease accurately. And that's just number one. You can't monitor for something if you don't know what it is. So monitoring early detection. I, I both face this because that's like, the important thing to do in order to be successful with an IPM approach. Establish guidelines for management action. That's a standard part of IPM, and it really varies. Even in the urban environment, it varies a lot. If you're a park with trails going by the trees, if you're, you got a big property with trees in the back 40 that no one will ever get near, your decisions are going to obviously be different. And then using the, the cultural, mechanical, biological, and chemical control strategies to control the pest. And it's really important that when you do this, you have to keep monitoring to see if your management practice is, a work, is working. And then you have to adapt as necessary. So here's a disease triangle. And we all have seen this before, I think. And that means that you have a susceptible host, you have a virulent pathogen and a favorable environment for that pathogen and then you get disease. So 
the whole goal is to break this triangle, you know, remove the susceptible host, uh, plant hosts that are resistant, change the environment in, in ways that could be either, you know, planting in a different area, your cultural practices, et cetera, and then controlling the virulent pathogen. <clears throat> so the problem we have is that the urban forest is the perfect incubator for invasive pests. And it's usually close to airports and uh, borders. There's a lot of ways things can come in, especially in Southern California, where we have so much traffic in ter terms of tourism and, and uh, commerce. So there's also a wide variety of trees in the urban environment. Anything that comes into Southern California will probably find a suitable host. And urban trees are not an agricultural commodity in California. So primarily the, the efforts regulatory and, and in terms of funding, uh, they go to the agricultural commodity, the pests that, that threaten that. And the urban forest is really not in that. So we always have a lack of funding uh, early on. So things get out of control in the urban environment and then they can spread to other areas. And something like the invasive shot hole borer, which is pretty cryptic in the way that it, it reproduces, can go unnoticed for a very long time. And that's what happened with this shot hole borer fusarium dieback. So there's the beetle. And uh, here's some damage you see on the branch. The, the beetle is, is a complex. It's spreading the fusarium dieback. So once the beetle inoculates the tree with the fusarium, and you, you'll start to see things like this dieback. Now the beetle is quite small, and I think that's another reason people have a hard time noticing this. If you wound a tree like a sycamore, you can wound it with a nail. It will bleed and stain just like it does when it's attacked by the beetle. You know, these are just reactions trees have, and people don't notice it. They just look at a tree and say, oh yeah, that's kind of normal. But uh, the, the male on the left and the female um, can cause that same kind of damage when they're attacking a tree. So they're, they're quite small. And we have two basic pests that are, are in this complex. We have the polyphicus shot hole borer and we have the corrosio shot hole borer. The corrosio actually came in a little bit later uh, from um, the Taiwan area. Um, and they have their own specific fungal uh, pathogen they carry with them. So in terms of the, the beetles carrying them, they, they are unique. The polyphicus shot hole borer carries Fusarium ulacei, and the corrosio shot hole borer carries Fus uh, Fusarium corrosio. That's one of the ways we can actually separate them other than DNA. So the vector and the pathogenic fungi um, have this, this life cycle based on the beetle carrying the, the fungus. So what happens is the, the beetle, it's the female, so the males don't leave the, the tree usually, they don't fly. The females will find a tree, they'll, they'll start a tunnel, and on the on the tunnel walls, they will actually grow the fungus. And once they lay their eggs and the eggs hatch, they, they'll feed on the fungus on the walls as will the adult female. And so there are various instars. Uh, one of these right here, that's when it first comes out of its pupil, it's, it's very light in color, and then it darkens up. So sometimes you might mistake the male for uh, and, uh, a newly emerged alien, but it's quite small, much smaller than the female. Then uh, the, the disgusting thing about this beetle, besides the fact that it kills trees, is <clears throat> the mothers mate with their sons and the brothers mate with their sisters. So in addition to killing trees, we need to control this, this beetle because it's disgusting. That's uh, there's not a, not acceptable uh, for that. So we 
We've done the research to try to find a way to control this. And one way is uh, looking at host material and looking at amplifier trees. So this is the tetrahedron. And now it's not a triangle, but uh, this is one of the more recent invasives where we have a complex of a vector and a pathogen. So now we, it becomes a little more complicated because we have to look at what we're going to do to control the vector. And then we have to look at what we're going to do to control the pathogen. And the, in terms of the reproductive host, uh, we have to, to look at susceptibility so we, we can focus our energies on the more, more susceptible ones, look at the growth stages and the vigor of the tree. And then from the environment, we look at seasonality, humidity, temperature, uh, and things that you, you've done to it in terms of cultural care, injury to the tree, and pesticide usage. So there's pathogen and then the vector. So this is a example of how a female came in here, she made the gallery, and then the galleries uh, were inoculated with the fungus, and then we started seeing dieback on the tree. And that's an indication that there's something wrong, you need to look closer. And as the fungus grows on the gallery walls, it can start to spread uh, further into the tree and uh, do severe damage. So here's part of the reproductive host list. We have 65 species currently on the host list, but these are the, the ones that seem to be more susceptible. And one thing we need to really emphasize here is that this is not a do not plant list. So you can, if you have the beetles under control and the fungus, you can potentially replant with some of these under those circumstances once it's under control. But you can see there, there are some very important, everything with a star is a, is a uh, native plant. So we have quite a few native plants that this beetle and fungus have found to be a very good host. And one of the things that we used to say in the beginning is if there's castor beer being around, then they can be reproducing in the castor bean and then moving out from the castor bean to nearby trees. And castor bean is, is really prevalent and you don't notice it, it's in the background. That's one thing that you really do have to worry about. The other one is if you have any box elder, that is the favorite host, and it really can build up populations in high numbers quickly. So most of the beetles will start their galleries in the same tree they were born in. And after about five or six generations, they can build up. One female can actually uh, produce a phenomenal number of beetles. And then once the, the tree is starting to decline and the populations of beetles have increased dramatically, then, then they will fly to other trees. Now, I want to bring this up because if you look in blue, blue represents, so this is where the Corocio shuttle board first got started in San Diego, and then it started moving its way north. And you see this uh, infestation up here in Santa Barbara. Uh, we, and we know now that this beetle can't fly that far. And this is because people are moving firewood and green waste from, some, from the southern part of Southern California all the way up into Santa Barbara. So that was probably moved on either green waste or firewood. So the IPM approach, was, which has proven to be very effective, um, we've, we've shown this many times. One of our primary examples currently is the IPM program for Chateau Barfisser and dieback at Disneyland. The Disneyland was heavily infested. We're losing a lot of trees. We implemented the IPM approach. Dr. Escalen and I were using that as a project. And we are able to bring it under control now to the point where we are not really dealing with Chateau Bar that much and we can now concentrate on other problems. It's still there, but it's it's under control. So you, what you do is you identify the pest and disease, you monitor, you establish guidelines, you use all the strategies, 
and then you keep monitoring and that that is critical to IPM being successful. When you look at infestations on trees, all the trees react a little differently. And when, when you see a hole, this is actually a female, and the females block the tunnels and they stick their butts out. And it's about the size of the tip of a medium-sized ballpoint pen. And if you look at sycamores, they'll stain. If you look at brachychitin and coletaria, they'll put out this gunky, uh, sugary substance. If you look at avocados, they have like these white volcanoes of sugar that, that um, when the reaction dries out, the sugar is left behind. And then box elder, there's nothing, has no defense. You're just going to see the sawdust being kicked up by the beetle because that is such a good host. Now, we, we are seeing in many areas where the beetles have gone through and wiped out the primary host or people have adapted a, a good IPM program that you can have active holes and then you can have inactive holes. So um, an active hole, you'll see the, the 0.85 millimeter entry hole. You'll see the staining from the fungus from the, get, from the gallery but you'll see uh, green tissue here. So that interface is where we're sampling in order to send it to a lab for identification. And this is sycamore and it really reacts by uh, staining. An inactive hole, uh, it's actually has a totally different look. There's, there's no weeping, there's no frass, no signs of beetle activity. And then the, the area around the hole starts to get this grayish dead tissue look. And this is a, so you can see the difference in that one and this dry hole here, that's inactive. And one way you can tell is to use um, water-based acrylic paint and just paint the hole and the females will then unblock that or they'll, um, sometimes they'll die in the paint if they if they get into a wet paint. But normally you let this dry and come back a day or two later, and you'll see that if there's an active population in that gallery, you'll see that the holes have been opened up. So we have developed some, some uh, measurements of infestation. We're saying low, a low infestation is less than 50 exit holes, entry holes moderates 50 and 150 and uh, no dieback and heavy is greater than 150 with no noticeable dieback and severe is greater than 150 entry exit holes and dieback. Those severe trees uh, really are the ones that become your amplifier trees, the heavy and severe, and those really need to be uh, removed if possible. So there's a monitoring program and that involves using a lure and it's only effective for about 50 yards or so. And so you put your, your traps about 10 to 50 yards apart. Uh, we research have shown that if you put about two and a half feet above the, uh, the ground, that's the best height for the trap. And it only tells you presence or absence. It doesn't really give you uh, a good number that you can use to determine control just tells you what's in the area. Is it there? And then relative, if you keep these traps going, it tells you from year to year if the numbers might be increasing, but it's not very accurate. And then you, you have to uh, use visual inspection with that. So we have developed a matrix. This is on our website, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with this, but the, uh, the matrix takes into account whether it's a low value tree or high value tree, if it's a reproductive host or not a reproductive host. And if it's a, a low, moderate or high infestation, you, there are decisions that you can make based on your situation. So everybody's matrix will be a little different, uh, but th these are the basic components that we use. And if you find beetles attacking a non-reproductive host that we don't have on our list, 
you need to contact us because we need to know whether it's now finding the new host that we need to monitor. So what are your management options? Well, we have um, culture on mechanical, so remove amplifier trees, and that's critical. Prune infested branches, many trees like oaks, they attack the branches first, or, or avocado, they attack the branches first. You can simply monitor, catch it early, and remove that branch. And if you do cut anything, the, the branch or the tree, you have to properly dispose of that infested wood. So here's the, the primary host. It's a box elder. This was in up in Ojai. And you can, you can see that this was a huge tree. And the beetles just to totally um, devastated that tree. And then it was interesting that you see this red, red color in the wood from the fusarium that's attacking the tree. And I understand that was actually quite valuable. So that tree was actually here. And we were finding beetles in this surrounding area from that one tree. Once that one tree was removed, we saw things kind of settle down a little bit. Here's another tree in Orange County that had branches that were infested. So we just simply removed the infested branches and we also treated the tree. And you can see that uh, there were quite a few branches that were removed. And you can see the staining of these trees uh, probably were supplying beetles into the surrounding areas. Once you cut the tree down, remove branches, you have to chip it to one inch or smaller. Uh, you can, if you're in an infested area, use the chips locally on the same property because the chipping kills 99.9% .9 of the beetles. And you already have beetles in the area. So that's uh, minuscule, it's not a problem. Just use that mulch, don't, don't move it anywhere if, if you don't have to. Um, you can compost it and you can solarize it or kiln dry it. That's uh, probably not kiln. I don't think there's a lot of kilns around, but that's an option. So, for chemical treatment, if you have a high value tree that you can use uh, chemicals, but we don't recommend spraying trees that aren't infested. That is a waste of your money because the way this beetle moves around, you, you don't want to spray things that, that aren't infested. However, if you do have a tree that's infested and it's a high value tree, then you can use a trunk spray with bifenthrin plus bacillus subtilis. And you can use, um, in conjunction with that, a soil drench or a injection with a metoclopred. And then the other option is you can trunk inject mmectin benzoate and propoconazole. So those are your options for a high value reproductive trees. So here's an area where we were doing an experiment with injections. And one of the things that uh, we, we caution people on and, and all the companies that sell um, the injection equipment also warn about this. If you inject and you're not careful and you, you drill into a canker and then don't clean your drill or change your drill and you drill another hole, you can actually infect the tree with a canker. So you can see here, there was an injection point and actually it was um, introducing pathogen and here's another one. So we have cankers that came in because the drills were, <clears throat> were dirty. Maybe they went from one infected tree to another unhealthy tree and drilled it and then inoculated it. Or they had on that trunk, they had a section that had a canker. And if you drill into that and you're not noticing that the, that the um, sawdust is darker colored and you drill into another area, you, you just inoculated that tree. So it's really important when you're doing this with injection where you drill into the tree that you clean your tools and make sure they're clean. And now the, the uh, common practice now is to spray the hole after you finish with Bacillus subtilis or Trichoderma in order to prevent cankers from uh, getting into that drill hole. So we 
<clears throat> we want to have the scenario where when we're looking at trees in a landscape, uh, we find the beetle and then we treat that tree, but we don't treat the other trees because that beetle is going, that population is going to build up in that single tree because that's what they do. They stay there for generations and then they spread to other trees. So it's, it's not effective or cost effective to uh, treat all the trees. But what you have to do is you have to keep monitoring. You don't stop monitoring. So don't panic. Uh, we have a good IPM project uh, program that actually works when it's done correctly. Uh, so IASHB can be kept under control. A good monitoring program is key. If you don't have a good monitoring program, then that's you know that's the big basic thing you need to do to have a successful program. And you have to act timely when you find it. So don't wait. Uh, when you find it, you need to have a plan. So we follow our IPM guidelines and then implement the IPM st strategies, and then prevent the spread of the beetle by you know, chipping wood and uh, not moving um, green waste around. And then if you do find it, you can uh, contact agencies that will help you. I think the thing you should do, if you think you found it, go to ishb.org and we have um, a quick, I mean, a little um, questionnaire that you fill out to help us when we get the information to determine whether or not you really do have a problem. So the ishb.org website has a tremendous amount of information on it. And that's that's really uh, where you should be going. Here is the assessment here. So you wanna go into the assessment, answer the questions. And once you go through the assessment, uh, that that's the first uh, cut for us to know whether or not we need to take the time to go out there and take a look at it. There's a tremendous, if you look at this bar, we have a tremendous amount of information and all these are pull downs that you can get more information from. So report it, go through the assessment, and then if it looks like it is a uh, shallow bore, then we probably can send somebody out uh, to look at it. And then we have updates. We have a, a outreach coordinator who is doing a great job with videos and and printed material and that type of thing. So I wanna thank all the people that were, have been involved in the past with this. Uh, the, the researchers are you know, Dr. Uh, Eskelin, Dr. Payne, Dr. Stahlhammer, Etal Jones, Sam, Shannon Lidge, then our uh, Randall Oliver is a communications person, Hannah's in, uh, in charge of statewide trapping, uh, UCI, we're, were really critical in terms of some of the, the basic research we did with efficacy studies and then all the agencies uh, out there. And then a lot of help from OC Parks and the different arborist companies out there. So with that, if you have any questions, uh, that's Bea on the right, I'm on the left. Brian Glenn's from the Ag Commissioners in the back. And we were out there uh, following up on a call or somebody thought they might have had actually GSOP in this case. So with that, any questions, if I have time. Thank you, John. Um, let's go ahead, Heidi. We've got a couple poll questions. So let's do those real quick. And then um, Heidi, maybe you can read the questions for John out of the Q&A, at least a couple of them. No problem. Um, first, the polls, I just launched it. The current state of ISHB infestations is ISHB has been eliminated from Southern California. ISHB is so widespread that it can't be managed or controlled. ISHB continues to spread, but it can be managed through IPM. That's correct. It's letter C. ISHB continues to spread, but it can be managed through IPM.
The next question is replanting trees, dot, dot, dot. A, should be done until amplifier trees have been removed. B, should use the reproductive host list as a do not plant list. C, should be done as soon as treatments begin. Or D, should never include native California tree species. Yep, that's right. It's A, should not be done until amplifier trees have been removed. And those are the two poll questions we have for this uh, section until the next, after the next presentation. Back to you, Jan. Okay, um, I'll go ahead. There's a few Q, um, questions in the Q&A, John. Um, let me find them. Oh, open. Okay, um, so there, uh, I guess is asking if this, if it's Southern California specific or statewide, the 64 species list? Oh, that would be statewide. What we do is, oh, the way that list was started <clears throat> is the initial work with uh, ISHB, um, we found those primary 15 trees being infested. And then as the the amplifier trees started appearing because people weren't doing anything about it. Then once you have an amplifier tree put it, pumping out you know, hundreds of thousands of beetles in an area, then the beetles run out of host material you know, that they prefer. And they'll actually start attacking hosts that were normally not attacked when the populations were low. And so as we found these really heavy infestations, we started finding all these other host trees that could be attacked. Now, uh, many of those trees on that list are grown throughout California. And, and so the climate uh, biology research that was done by uh, Dr. Tim Payne and Colin Omeda found that it could actually move all the way up California potentially. And with climate change, that even becomes a, a even more realistic outlook. So that list is, if that plant on that list is in the top 15, it definitely can be attacked anywhere in the state. Then the other ones will be attacked uh, more of a kind of a side effect of amplifier trees being in the area and pumping out so many beetles that it just becomes desperate and goes for them. That the host reproductive host is when the beetle can can introduce the fungus. The fungus can grow on that tree, and then then that beetle can reproduce. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, one more, real quick. Hi, John. Thanks for the presentation. What are the parameters for quote unquote success, where you can pull back on the control options? Is it is it dependent on the client or are you using a community population number? This is from Allison. So it's gonna be primarily on the client. We're, we're really having difficulties with regional control of this because when you're, when you're going from public agencies, which are in this case easier to work with because they have large areas and they have budgets, mostly, then you run into the private property, private tree owners, it gets really difficult. So in Orange County, we were fortunate that the Orange County Fire Authority and CAL FIRE 
were concerned about dead trees being a fire hazard. So in that case, that agency said, uh, because the fire hazard, we're going to remove trees that are dead. Uh, but we run into HOAs and one HOA is really cooperative and the next one is not. So uh, it's a real hodgepodge. So that's, that's always the difficulty is when you work with private property and private tree owners versus say like an agency that covers a large area. Okay, great. Thank you. I know there's a few more under the q and I don't know if you have time maybe to address those. Um, but otherwise, maybe at the end, we can cycle back if those haven't been answered in the meantime. But thank you, John. It was good to see you again. Appreciated You're having you share. All right. Um, I'd like to introduce our next presenter. Beatrice Nobuo Behrman, she is the Urban Forestry and Natural Resources Advisor um, for UC Cooperative Extension in Orange in Los Angeles County. And she's going to give us an update on gold spotted oak borer. Bea, welcome. Thank you. Um, let's get started. Hi. Well, thanks, um, Jan, for the introduction. And I'll be presenting on uh, GSO. Oh, let me start my video so you can see my face. Um, so this update, or it, it's going to cover some of the basics as well, and that's good because there's a bunch of people who hasn't haven't been yet to any of these kind of trainings. Um, is made with a lot of input from many other uh, collaborators from many different agencies, including Kim Corella. Kevin Turner, Stacey Hishinuma, Andrea Hefty, Tom Scott, Jan Gonzalez, Nathan Gregory, and Erin Andriata um, from all different kinds of uh, organizations. So to get us started, uh, what we call Gold Spot Oak Border, or also GSOB, is um, it's a flat-headed border. It's from the Bupresidae family. Uh, also known as jewel beetles, like emerald ash borer, is a very closely related pest to goldsward oak borer. It's the same genus. Um, so it's one of these small beetles, not as small as invasive shaho borers. Um, but um, one of the things that it has in common with shaho borer is that Unlike many other borders, it does attack dying trees. Uh, the, uh, sorry, that attacks dying trees. This one attacks healthy trees. Um, so it does attack three kinds of oaks here in Southern California. The coastline oak and the California black oak are the preferred hosts, uh, but they can also attack canyon live oak. And we have seen them attacking Englemann oak, although it does seem like that only happens when the populations are super high on um, mostly host like coast live oak surrounding an Englemann oak. We haven't seen it just attacking a, a single Englemann oak around. Um, so here in Southern California, this beetle is um, attacking oaks from San Diego to um, LA County. We um, know that they are native to Southeast Arizona where there's a different kind of climate. So the oaks, when they get attacked in Arizona are in, is during a season, which is the, during the spring and summer, but there's rains during that season, so the trees are not stressed because they have water available during the time that they're getting attacked, so they're available, they're able to respond to the attacks. In California, where we have a Mediterranean climate and the more the season where there's more impact from these beetles, which is again the spring and summer is the dry season where most of the trees have some level of stress from lack of water. And so it's a lot harder for the trees here in Southern California to respond to 
um, a GS of attack. So it is pretty widely distributed in San Diego County, and that's where we found it first. Uh, it was first identified in 2008, but we suspect it's been there since the 90s and probably came there through the movement of infested firewood. And then from the epicenter in San Diego County, we started finding new focuses of infestation in um, northern uh, areas, but kind of localized. And again, usually linked to the movement of in fire, uh, infested firewood from San Diego to other locations, and then from those locations to the next. Um, oh, I can't make it. There we go. This is an aerial picture of what the oak mortality due to ghost bird oak bird looks like. This is in a location close to the Skansan Watai, which is basically um, ground zero for the G sub infestation. And you can see a lot of oaks have died in there. Um, in cases like this, where uh, the infestation goes on and it doesn't get controlled for a long time, there's up to 45% uh, infestation rate. And uh, it tends to attack mostly the oaks that are bigger and bigger diameter. So you end up having a loss of the bigger trees in your sand. Once you get to the edges of the stand, the infestation drops to about 10 or less percent. So it, it kind of becomes localized to the center of the stand. The life cycle of this beetle um, starts with an adult emerging uh, from the tree. This happens sometime between mid-May and September. And when the adults emerge, they leave this D-shaped exit holes in the bark that are very characteristic of this pest. The adults will mate with each other, um, will find a new tree that they like to lay their eggs. Their eggs are very, very small that you will probably not see them ever. Um, they lay their, I, I have been looking at a lot, lot of oaks and I haven't been able to see the eggs because they're so tiny and they just lay them in the crevices of the bark. So they're pretty protected in there. Out of the um, eggs comes out little larvae that will um, bore into the bark. And so the larvae will start basically eating all the phloem and the cambium under the bark. And uh, as they do, they start growing and all that area that the, the larvae is, you know, using as food that all that area gets damaged and that causes the, um, you know, a blockage on the phloem, on the vascular system of the tree, uh, which ends up uh, affecting the tree and eventually killing the tree. Um, during uh, October to June, so during the winter, this larvae uh, will stay uh, as a pre-pupae and sort of kind of hibernate or pass the winter as a pre-pupae. Then when it starts getting warm again, it pupates and then comes out in, again, May to September and the cycle starts over again. So it takes about basically one year for the GSOP to do a full on uh, cycle. And so when we want to see if our trees are infested or not, the main evidence of attack are those D-shaped exit holes. Um, this exit holes happens when, once the beetle left the tree, but really the entry holes are basically not, a, not visible. And so one of the main things that we have to to know if that tree has to use up is to find those D-shaped exit holes. And we know that if we see some exit holes, there's likely more larvae developing under that bark. Um, this is, these holes are about three millimeters in size. So 
to give an idea, the writing in a quarter, uh, each letter is about that, the same size as the holes. Um, and they're D-shaped exit holes because they're flat head borders. So their head is flat, but they still have a nice round belly. And this is the hole that they make exactly the size of their, um, of their body so they can just come out of the bark. Other crown symptoms that we can see is uh, some dieback. So the, a lot of the times we are done to go and check on trees that show some kind of dieback, but be aware that uh, when a tree is recently infested, it won't show much dieback, right? So this tree in this picture here looks pretty healthy, even though it does have evidence of G sub attack. It will take about three to five years for a tree to die from G cell. The picture over here, we see that the tree is starting to um, get the crown more thin and it's starting to show um, you know, signs of decline. And then usually if the tree has any other thing that is affecting it, like root rot or drought or any other predisposing factor, then the tree might die even faster than that. But otherwise, we can have a tree slowly declining from three to five years until it finally succumbs to G cell. And in some cases, we can see parts of the tree getting more affected. So we have like some branches that show dieback and the rest of the tree looks more or less okay. In the case of uh, black oak, one of the things that we will see is that black oaks tend to um, drop their leaves during the winter. Well, in this, when they are affected with GSOB, the trees will go brown, but they tend to hold on to their dead um, leaves. The leaves will, will go brown, but they, the trees tend to hold on to those dead leaves during the winter. They don't shed them. And then you can see that the next um, round of leaves tends to be a lot smaller than the original one. So those are sort of uh, signs that just give us an idea that something is going on with that black oak and it's possible um, G sub. Other things we can see is a staining on the bark that's in both of the species in coastline oak and in black oak. And um, that dieback, the staining, we can also see sometimes woodpecker activity. The woodpeckers would like to go get the pupae that are under the bark and will leave that particular mark. So all of this, these three things are things that will make us go and check uh, how is that uh, tree doing? We know that something is going on there, but in order to assign that decline to a uh, G sub infestation, we need to see that D shaped exit hole. And then um, a more definitive way to know if the tree is infested, but is um, you know, super invasive and should not be done uh, in most cases is if you um, take an ax and you look under the bark, you will find the galleries that the larvae left on the um, foam and cambium layer. That's the damage uh, done by the larvae. Um, that is definitive uh, of a G sub infestation. And one of the things that a lot of the bark beetles have is um, the pattern of their galleries will give you a clue on what species of beetle is attacking your tree. Well, in the case of GSUB, the pattern is that basically there's no pattern. It's all like a big mess of sort of galleries just intercepting each other and going all over the place. And this is something that we would do um, when we are looking at a tree that is already heavily infested. And so we might do that to, you know, double, triple check, but usually don't, we don't do that to a tree that is overall healthy and we might want to try to save because that's a, a big uh, damage to the tree. So one interesting thing about GSOP is that very much like Shahu, where they tend to uh, 
concentrate their populations in a few trees. Those trees, we, we call them brood trees or amplifier trees. And they tend to be about seven to 10% of the infested trees go within this category. So um, basically there is, there could be many trees that are infested, but only a few of them get this severe infestation. Um, we consider them uh, severely infested once they have more than 25 to 30 exit holes and they start showing dieback. Um, that's when we consider, okay, this tree is a brood tree. And the interesting thing from that is that of the whole population of trees of in an area, those amplifier trees or brood trees contain between 60 to 90% of the beetles. So knowing this about the biology of the beetle can help us manage it because those will be good targets for removal. If we get rid of those trees, we get rid of 60 to 90% of the beetles in an area, which is already a step forward, a good uh, step forward. And they are not always very obvious. Uh, the tree here in this picture does have some dieback, but it's not a tree that which is like immediately caught your attention. But this tree had about 300 exit holes in it. And the tree over here that was already dead was severely infested for a while and had already died. And that by then it had a thousand exit holes in it. So that also goes to show that if you leave those amplifier trees and do nothing, those thousand beetles just fly out and go into the neighboring trees. So those are that's why when we think about management, one of the options is to get rid of this um, amplifier trees or brood trees. And we'll talk about this in a minute a little bit more. Uh, but before that, talking about dead trees, uh, I wanna talk about how Goldsboro Oper spreads. So um, these beetles don't really like to fly that far, uh, at most maybe a mile. Uh, there's other beetles, that uh, can fly very long distances and they actually mainly spread by flying. But that's not the case of GSUB. GSUB mostly goes out, out of the tree where they were born and flies usually to the next tree or the next few trees in the same areas. Actually, they rarely jump over, uh, you know, like the, the hills of a valley from one canyon to the next one by themselves. Um, the main way they move long distance is through human assisted spread through firewood. And this makes uh, sense because they uh, kill oaks. Oaks are uh, oak wood, uh, firewood is valuable. And if you have a dead oak and you have, you know, you're chopping down that oak, a lot of people think, okay, well, at least I'm going to get a buck out of this. And, and just sell that wood or even share it with their neighbors, you know, like, hey, or friend, I have free wood for you. And something that I could think about be thought as a nice gesture, as in like, I'm going to share some firewood for you. Um, unknowingly, these people can be moving fire um, pests and specifically GSA from one place to another. So a lot of our outreach has to go with. Um, non-moving uh, firewood that comes from a location that has G-subs. Um, ideally, you would not move any kind of firewood uh, any long distance because they could harbor any kind of pests. But in the case of G-sub, it's particularly uh, the main way it moves from one location to another. So if we are going to work on managing um, GSOB, the, uh, the guidelines go from first prevention, so we don't want to get it in our location, or if we have it, we don't want to spread it to the next location. Then detection and monitoring, as we will always say, that's one of the main things we need to do. We need to find the infestations early, so we actually can do some action, and it's 
feasible, both, uh, you know, from workload and from a monetary standpoint. Uh, and then we're going to be removing amplifier trees. And that way we'll be removing between 60 and 90% of the beetles in the area. The wood that comes from those amplifier trees need to be properly managed. And I'm going to show you options for that. And then you can protect high value oaks with pesticides if that's um, something you'd like to do. And so in the case of brood trees, as I say, removal might be the best uh, options. And so when we do that, we have to remember that we still have pupae and larvae in the bark of that downwood that comes from the removal of the amplifier trees. And to give you an example, um, th this little amount of bark that came from an amplifier tree produced um, all, of, oh, all of these uh, beetles. Actually, it was 186 adult beetles that came from those uh, that little amount of bark. So really, uh, we need to do something with that wood to prevent the spread of the pest. So the options that we have, if I can, there we go. Um, we can either chip the wood if you're Ha, especially if you have an arborist doing the job, it usually can be included in the scope of work. When you do the chipping, it has to be done for uh, a size of chip that is three inches or smaller. Uh, and that way, if you chip the, the wood to that size, you can be sure that there's no GSA on those chips. So those chips can be spread in the area, used as mulch, um, or disposed of. Uh, but if you want to use the wood as firewood, um, there's safe ways to do that. So you can season the wood. Uh, the wood has to be seasoned for at least two years to make sure that there's no GSA that has been, that is survived, uh, has survived in that wood. Once the bark starts kind of naturally falling off that wood that has been seasoned, it's usually, um, it's usually safe to move. Um, and to do that safely, so if you just season the wood on site, after two years, that wood will be safe to move, but all the beetles that came out of that wood will still be in that area, will just go to the neighboring trees. Uh, that is why it's also never a good idea to stock wood next to, uh, next to a tree. Right, because if something comes out of that wood, it might go and just find a house right away. But that wood can be seasoned, um, contained within a metallic mesh. Uh, that way, when the beetles come out of the wood, they don't, they can't escape. They're basically trapped within that mesh, and then they eventually die of uh, starvation. You gotta be very careful. Make sure that there's no little gaps in that mesh because these beetles are little Houdinis and they'll find their way out if there is a way out. Um, the other faster way is to remove the bark. And then you can, once you remove the bark, you can use the rest of the wood as firewood and that will be safe. So debark wood is totally safe um, regarding GSO. All, all the beetles, all the larvae are in the bark. Though removing the bark is not necessarily easy, it's pretty time consuming and a little bit, and it takes a lot of effort, but it is an option for that. Uh, you just have to remember that the bark that you remove, something has to happen with that bark. That bark is the one that has the beetles. So either you can chip the bark, you can bury the bark, or you can just burn it right away. Maya? Yes. Excuse me for interrupting, but I just want to let you know there's about five minutes left. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So for insecticide treatments, we um, recommend them for high value oaks, but they're only appropriate if there's GSOP in the area. So if you if there's no GSOP, known GSOP infestations in the area, it doesn't make sense to um, put pesticides on a tree. But um, 
if there is, then if it's a high value oak, it it is something that you can do. Um, only, of course, treat only the whole species. And then if they're bigger than eight inch diameters, GSOP don't tend to attack uh, trees that are smaller than that. And we have to have a tree that is healthy and you know vigorous. So it has to have a healthy crown and it doesn't have to be an amplifier tree. So if it has more than 25 or maybe 30 exit holes, then um, that tree should be removed and not treated. For options, we have contact insecticides. Those are uh, sprayed in the trunk and the bigger branches. Um, Carbol or bifenthrin are two of the options for this. This is a less expensive option, uh, but you have to apply it in the case every year. Um, and it cannot be applied uh, close to bodies of water because these pesticides are pretty detrimental to water life. Uh, but if the location is not close to a body of water, it can be applied. And if, it, if it's done correctly by someone that has a license and knows what they're doing, there's, uh, there shouldn't be posing much risk to other non-target uh, species. Uh, the systemic insecticides are another option. So in this case, it could be imamectin benzoid or imidacloprid. They are uh, injected into the trunk of the tree. Um, it requires, uh, it, it should last for two years, but it's, a, it's more expensive and more labor intensive. But as uh, John mentioned before, when we do trunk injections, we uh, have the risk of getting, we're making a wound in the tree and those wounds can get infected with other pathogens. So we always have to weigh the pros and cons. But in some locations, like in this tree over here, right next to this uh, little stream, uh, there's, no other op there's no other option. We cannot spray that tree. So if we want to you know, protect it somehow, we're going to have to do a trunk injection. And just thinking about the life cycle and when should we be doing our management uh, actions. So this is uh, the life cycle of the beetle shown in a slightly different way. So these are the months of the year. And this shows how the adults start emerging in May, but then June and July is the peak of the emergence. And then they kind of tapers. The egg laying happens a little bit later than that. Then we have larval feeding during fall and that's during the sorry the summer and the fall and then the prepay is how they overwinter and then they pupate as they start to get warm again so for treatments we you, if you're going to do a contact insecticide you want it to be applied right as the adults start to come out and i put a note here that um you should consider treating a little bit earlier if you're not in the mountains or if you're in the coastal area here. Um, this should be a little bit early because this life cycle has been done with data from Green Valley, which is a little bit higher elevation. It's a little bit um, colder. And in, over here in the coastal area, everything is kind of shifted a little bit earlier. And then if you want to do surveys for monitoring, the ideal time to do them is between November and March. So it's after all the adults emerge. So you can actually have a good idea of what's going on um, in, in your place. If you do a survey in, let's say, June, you might be missing a lot of the trees that are infested because you won't know until the adults start coming out in July. So to keep it, um, you know, the idea here is like you can treat, but you have to think before you do it. So first you have to make sure it's the right pest. You know, uh, as you saw with uh, John's talk, if it's shahobar and the tree is not infested, you don't want to treat. But with GSOP, you might want to treat if it, even if the tree is not infested, as long as there's GSOP in the surrounding area. So it's really good to make sure you can confirm that you have the right pest, uh, either getting trained, or you can also consult with UCCE, the Act Commissioner's Office, CDFA, just to get a good idea of your pest. Uh, think about if you should report the presence of the pest. A lot of, for GSAB, if we is a new location, we really uh, 
encourage you to report it in our website so we know that there's something else going on in there and we can help uh, direct resources to that area. And then depending on what is the pest you're working on, you can decide what's the best course of action. And if you're gonna be used chemical management, you have to think about what's the more adequate for that particular tree in those particular circumstances. Again, if it's close to water or not, if the tree is healthy or not, um, and where the tree is in, in, and so on. So for a management plan, you want to work with researchers and experts if you can, communicate with other land managers, know what's going on in your area, and have a pest management approach that includes monitoring, identifying and removing root trees, management of infested wood, and have possible treatments uh, of infested trees, and the buffer trees, which are, we usually end up treating all the trees that are 300 feet around a known infested tree. And then you have to make sure you do have communication. You have to inform the public about the activities that are happening, uh, when and why. People get really upset when uh, trees are getting, you know, are, are getting removed and with good reason. Like nobody likes to uh, see our urban trees uh, gone. So explaining what's going on and why and how by removing one tree, you might be protecting the rest of them really goes a long way. And then you, you might even recruit someone to let you know if there's other problematic trees in the area that you should put your attention on. Um, make sure you engage the community, they know what's going on. And also that way you can help prevent. And um, again, especially with GISO, with the movement of infested firewood, knowing that there's GISO in the area and letting the people in the area know that they shouldn't be moving firewood, it's a, it's a good idea. And just to close up, I wanna share the case of Weir Canyon, which is here in Orange County. Um, it's a success story. So I like I always like to finish with that. It's an area that had a very rapid response. The action was taken immediately after 2014 when the G7 infestation was confirmed. They came up with a management plan with surveys, removals, and treatment of infested trees. They started collaborating and communicating with the, the other um, land managers and with the uh, UCCE, US Forest Service. Um, they engaged the community with volunteer training events. And after treating for many years, now they are seeing a very positive response from the trees. So they actually went from having about 300 infested trees in 2015 and 2016, including 30 amplifiers each year that had to be removed to only 12 trees that shows levels of any kind of infestation in 2022. And those 12 trees had one or two new exit holes and that's it. So really, really good um, progress on the management of the infestation. And now they're, think they're planning on, you know, just finding ways to treat less aggressively and keep um, managing the area, but without having to apply that much uh, pesticides. So if you want more information, you can go to gsub.org. We have lots of uh, information there, training announcements, a reporting tool where you can uh, let us know if you suspect there's gsub in your area. And then there's a really good story map for gsub management that you can consult uh, so you can uh, get more information there. All right, um, thank you so much. And I hope there's time for like maybe one or two questions if possible. Hi, Bea. Um, I don't think so. Would you be willing to go into the Q&A um, pod and answer, um, type in any answers that you can address? We'd yes. appreciate it. Um, thank you, great update. Um, Heidi, I'm gonna turn it over to Heidi again for a couple of quick poll questions. We'll do these real quick and then we'll, start with our next presenter. All right. Thanks, Shan. Here's the first poll question. What is the main sign of, Paul, or of <laughs> gold spotted oak borer infestation? D-shaped exit holes in the trunk, perfectly round small exit holes in the trunk, or herbivory damage on the leaves? Okay. 
Okay, results. That's right. It's a D-shaped exit holes in the trunk. So the next one, um, which of these is not an acceptable way to manage wood infested with gold spotted oak borer? A, chip or grind to less than three inches, debark the wood and chip the bark to less than three inches. C, season the wood under tarp or mesh for two years. Or D, sell, give away or move infested wood. It's D, uh, which of these is not an acceptable way to manage wood, sell, give away, or move infested wood. Great, thank you. Like people are, folks are paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, okay. Um, sorry, we're getting a few minutes behind schedule, but we'll go ahead and move forward um, to our next topic um, regarding South American palm weevil. I'd like to introduce Mark Hoddle. He is a biological control specialist and the director of the Center for Invasive Species Research at UC Riverside. And he's going to again talk about South American palm weevil. Mark, do you want to share your screen? Great. Thank you and welcome. Okay, right. Um, hang on a minute. Let me, whoops. Uh, now I just closed everything down by accident. Just a second. I've got to rescue myself here. God, what did I do? Zoom. Um, I'm guessing you guys can see my screen, but it's disappeared for me. We That's can great. see your presentation. Share. There it is. Uh, why is that not coming up? <sighs> Brother. Um, a minute. I don't know what's gone wrong here. <laughs> uh, it's always a problem. Nope, that's not right. Stop. Uh, yeah, right. If, we see your presentation. Yes. Okay. Hang on a minute. Ah, there we go. Oh, How's that? Now, now we see yours. Okay, there you go. Great. Thank you. All right. I've got a lot to cover. Um, so we're going to go over South American palm weevil and what's happening in Southern California. Right, we'll go over some of the damage that the weevil does to the palms, cover its biology, quickly update you on the spread into and throughout Cal uh, San Diego County, give you some brief updates on the six and a half year monitoring program we've been running at the Sweetwater Reserve. I'll show you the trapping results, surveillance we've been doing with drones, and then update you on the latest mortality rates of palm trees that are growing around the reserve. We'll go over some management options, talk briefly about insecticide applications, how to use traps. We just got a big grant from the California Department of Pesticide Regulations to test a tract and kill in San Diego County. And I'm glad to see Eric's on here because I've been meaning to contact him about getting this going. Quickly discuss some biocontrol options that we were going to be investigating in Brazil, but all that got shut down because of COVID. And uh, quickly just provide a little bit of information to you. I get asked about this a lot. People catch weevils, they find these mites on them and they want to know what on earth are those mites doing on the bodies of the weevils. And then we'll finish up with um, a website to go to. There is no um, active monitoring program in California to document the spread of the weevil. And we are relying on community scientists to report on this website that I'll show you at the end of this talk, um, the latest finds that you're seeing, where you can update, uh, upload photographs, uh, contact information, street addresses, and we're plotting all that into a Google Earth map. And we are relying heavily on uh, community scientists to help us track the spread of the weevil through uh, Southern California. Okay, so this whole story began in 2010 down in uh, Tijuana, and I got some calls about some dying palm trees down there. And uh, we went down and had a look, and in those palms we found this big black weevil. And this was a bit of a surprise to us that we were finding these black weevils killing palm trees, because at this time we were battling an infestation of a similar looking palm weevil, uh, the Rhynchophorus vulneratus, the red striped palm weevil, which had invaded Laguna Beach. We successfully eradicated this red stripe weevil from Laguna, but while we were running that program, South American palm weevil pretty much went um, uncontrolled, came in through Tijuana, established around San Isidro sometime in uh, 2014. This is the type of damage you're going to see when your Canary Island date palms are attacked by the palm weevil. 
uh, let me see we get my laser pointer going here that basal thatch that you'll find or the basal sheath at the bottom of the fronds where they attach to the palm trunk will be riddled with holes kind of looks like swiss cheese when the fronds detach from the top of the trunk you'll see that they have these large holes in them these are the pupation chambers that the weevils have drilled into the base of the frond it's within these chambers that they gather up the palm fibers and then they'll spin their cocoons the central fronds will eventually drop out of the palm and you'll be left with this trunk that basically has a halo of these green fronds attached to the top. They will eventually turn brown and fall out as well. So if you looked inside the palm, you'd see that the top part of the palm, the crown region or the apical meristem has been heavily attacked here by these weevil larvae. This is the life stage that kills the palms. They damage the growing area of the palm. That damage is irreparable. Once it is heavily damaged, the palm goes into decline, eventually dies. And the larvae are responsible for this. It is very warm. It has a very distinctive odor. It looks like uh, oatmeal when you pull it out. It is incredibly wet. As water is being drawn up through the trunk, it is basically pooling in the cavity, the bowl that these weevils are, are digging out through the consumption of the apical meristem that sits at the very top part of the trunk. They will not bore their way down into the wooden part of the trunk. The uh, damage is going to be limited, like I mentioned, to a bowl that's maybe no more than 12 inches, 12, maybe 18 inches deep into the top of the trunk. That's where all the activity is happening. Removing these palm trees after the weevil has killed them is expensive. It's quite dangerous. It's recommended that you get professional arborists in to, to deal with the material. It has to be disposed of properly. We recommend putting these fronds through a chipper. If that's not possible, to tarp them up like you see in this photograph, and then tarp up the trunk that also may have palm weevils still developing the top part of it here. The idea is to get it to a landfill as quickly as possible, get it buried. Um, you cannot burn this material. A palm trunk will not burn. You'd have to pour hundreds of gallons of gasoline onto the trunk to get it to incinerate properly. So having it removed, chipped and buried is the best way to deal with this. So these dead fronds prevent, uh, present a significant dropping hazard. And you can see from these photographs here at Imperial Beach that when the wind blows, the fronds fall down. They obviously hit these fences here, they land on the top of cars, they present a significant hazard to people and pets, especially young children. The bases of these fronds have wickedly long and sharp spines which can easily pierce uh, the bottoms of your shoes and go through your pant legs and do quite a bit of damage. So the life cycle is pretty simple. These are long snout weevils. So the males and females have these long rostrums, snouts or beaks. The females use that long nose to drill a hole into the top part of the palm tree where the apical meristem is located. She'll then turn around and use her ovipositor, which is an egg laying tube to lay eggs into that hole that she has drilled. Then that hole will be covered over with a mucus-like solution, kind of sticky. And then from those eggs hatch the grubs. And the number of instars varies anywhere from maybe five, eight to 10, depending on the quality of the food and the temperature. And these grubs can grow up to three or more inches in size, They're very large grubs. And it is their feeding in the apical meristematic area and that palm crown that results in the death of the palm tree. Once they have finished uh, the, the larval stage, they then migrate often out into those uh, bottoms of those fronds, excavate those pupil chambers. They'll gather up the fibers, spin these very tough fibrous cocoons. You can see here I've cracked open one of the cocoons. You can see the pre-pupil larva here. It's finished spinning up its cocoon. Now that larva, once it's inside that protective cocoon, will shed its skin or molt its exoskeleton. It'll enter the pupil stage where you can see the wing buds developing here. Then it will undergo metamorphosis and then the adult form emerges. And obviously the adult has the legs, the beak, for uh, chewing into the palm trees, it has wings and it can fly. So the adult form is strikingly different to the larval form here, which is basically a big fat grub whose main purpose here is to eat. The adult's main purpose is to mate, disperse and lay eggs. So there are males and females in the population. They're very easy to identify. Males on the top of the snout have these bristles, which form this type of comb. The females lack those bristles and the top of her snout is very smooth. And you can easily sex them by picking them up and looking at them with your eyes. You don't need any magnifying equipment to, to do that. Now, in addition to this weevil killing palm trees outright, 
in parts of Mexico, um, I was down in Colima this summer looking at coconut palms down there. This uh, weevil spreads a, a plant pathogenic nematode called red ring nematode, which is a lethal uh, nematode infection for palm trees. It can kill the palms and it gets its name, common name from the fact that infected palms end up with this red ring. I don't know why it's red and I don't know why it's perfectly circular. I've asked several nematologists about this and they cannot answer that question for me. So once the weevil gets into the palm tree, begins chewing up the palm, they um, can eject or ingest into the palm tree these nematodes, either through the saliva that they're feeding, through defecating, or even through overpositing eggs into the palm tree. So when I was in Kalima, we cut down a, a coconut palm that was infected, it had obvious red ring nematode symptoms. We cut it open, we could see the red staining through the trunk. We only found one larva in that palm tree, which suggests that the rate of transmission or the efficiency of nematode transmission from the weevil into the palms is, is very, very high. Some experiments suggest that as little as six to 20 weeks post-infection with the nematodes, the palm dies. So even if you were able to kill the weevils in your palm trees, maybe protect the palm tree after you've got rid of those weevils with insecticides, if the weevils have delivered that nematode into the palm tree, it is a death sentence and that palm will still die. Fortunately for us in California, we have not detected red ring nematode in the state yet. However, as we have seen with a number of insects that vector plant pathogens, often we get the insect first, and then many years later, the pathogen shows up. So it may only be a matter of time until red ring nematode shows up in California. Palm weevils, Francophorus um, palmarum, the South American palm weevil is a palm specialist. You can see here a list of palm species that it is known to attack. And I gleaned these data from Google. So this was just basically armchair research. You can see coconuts. Yes, they attack coconuts, but we have no coconuts growing in California. The nearest coconut um, gardens, large commercial gardens, are down in Colima in, in, in Mexico. However, since the South American palm weevil now has been here for about eight, eight years, maybe going on 10 years now, depending on exactly when it, it is established, California has now begin, has begun to develop its own host palm list. And I'm going to run through a series of slides now which demonstrate the new associations that this weevil is forming with ornamental palm trees in Southern California. It is a mashup. We have planted palms from around the world. They have no evolutionary association with South American palm weevil, but this weevil is now able to contact palm trees, which it has never seen before in its evolutionary history. So let's start with the Guadalupe palms. Brahea regulus is susceptible. This one was killed by South American palm weevil in Balboa Park. Blue fan palms, Brahea aromata, are susceptible to South American palm weevil. You can see the damage here on the trunk oozing these liquids, which have a very distinctive odor. And then we were able to pull some adult weevils out of those um, galleries. So the Senegal palms from Africa, Phoenix reclinata, have been attacked and killed. Chilean wine palms appear to be quite popular in the Southern Californian landscape. This one also is at Balboa Park, was attacked and killed by the South American palm weevil. Second palm tree, Chilean wine palm killed. Uh, Chilean palms, wine palms in the urban area have been attacked and killed. These photographs were provided by Ricardo Aglia. So you can see that here the palm sort of looks kind of healthy, but the fronds had those tunnelings at the bases of them. The arborists went up and had a look. The inside of the palm had been completely excavated. They found pupil cocoons and weevils. So this is a reasonably good host for South American palm weevil as well. Sable palms have been attacked and killed by South American palm weevil. Uh, Prichardia monroy, a palm native to Molokai in Hawaii, planted in urban areas here in Southern California, is also vulnerable to attack. I'm just going to zoom through this because I'm don't have enough time to deal with it all. A uh, Prichardia minor, another species that's been attacked and killed at Balboa Park. Uh, Parajubia species as well, also attacked and killed by South American palm weevil. Bismarckia nobilis, these are quite common in the urban landscape, appear to be reasonable hosts for South American palm weevil as well. This is a photograph is from La Jolla. Another one here in the southern part of San Diego County, again attacked and killed. Dipsis palms, triangle palms appear to have been susceptible to attack as well. And I've had these reports of uh, the tops falling off uh, Washingtonia robusta, the Mexican fan palm. The person that sent this in 
have unfortunately failed to provide any corroborating evidence like weave photographs of weevils or larvae. So we're not sure if this is the case. However, you have seen a lot of palms here. The numbers that have attacked in that list are relatively low. Singletons, maybe no more than 10 at the most. By far, the most popular host, most preferred host of South American palm wheel is the Canary Island date palms, uh, Phoenix canariensis. Those are the palms that you see all through the urban landscape. They're often pruned at the top to look like pineapples. That by far is the most preferred palm host that is attacked by South American palm weevil. So a question I get asked a lot, Oh, is my video? It's not going to work. Oh, that's too bad. Um, is well, how far do these palm weevils fly? And we were able to hook them up to these little flight mills. There's a static photo here. The oh, hang on a minute. I might be able to get the video to work. Um, where's my laser pointer? Oh, gosh, come on. Mm. Oh, over here, this side. All right, let me just turn off my laser pointer, bring up my cursor. There we go. Okay, so they spin around in circles, they're hooked up to a laptop computer. And each time they go around, the computer records the distance flown. So each revolution is about a meter. So we can record how far they fly, how fast they fly, how often do they fly. We can correlate all those flight data with the size of the weevil, its sex, whether it's fed, not fed, males versus females, all that good stuff. So we've done a lot of analyses on those types of data. And what we've found is really quite striking. These weevils are very strong flyers. At least in the laboratory, they can fly on average maybe up to 25 miles in, in a 24-hour period. They'll lose about 20% of their body weight over that time, and they can fly consistently for about four to five hours before they run out of juice and sort of slow down. We had one female, absolutely amazing. She flew over 140 kilometers in one hour. She was just about dead when she came off that flight mill. But man, that was a lot of distance that, that she covered in that 24 hour period. So very impressive ability to fly. But perhaps importantly, the most important way that these weevils could be spread very long distances very rapidly would be through the accidental movement of palm trees that are infested with South American palm weevil. Currently, there are no uh, quarantine restrictions on moving palms out of infested areas in San Diego County. I'm really surprised at this stage that there have been no large jumps in reports of this weevil being found in other parts of California. All the activity for the last 10 years or so is still restricted to the more southern parts of San Diego County, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. So this situation really started to unfold here in 2000 down in Todos Los Santos, very close to Cabo San Lucas at the tip of the Baja Peninsula. This was the first report of South American palm weevil in the Baja Peninsula. South American palm weevil has a range throughout most of mainland Mexico here up into the Colima area. It's native to parts of the Caribbean, Central and South America as well. But the first report of this weevil was here in the very tip of the uh, Baja Peninsula. So from 2000 to 2010, when it was first detected in Tijuana, it probably was just creeping up the peninsula on its own at a rate of about eight miles per month or covering a distance of about 93 miles per year, assuming it was just flying up the peninsula on its own, hopscotching from palm tree to palm tree. So it's likely that it had the capacity to fly that far, or it's also likely maybe infested palms were moved from down here all the way up to Tijuana and planted in gardens. I'm not so sure that's the case, because the first records here in Todos Los Santos were in Washingtonia Robusta, the Mexican fan palm, and they were in uh, a natural preserves area. So this is the situation in California right now. The most northern report that we have of the weevil is in San Marcos, and that report was in 2019. Three years ago, we've had no reports of the weevil being further north of San Marcos at this time, and it seems to have moved about as eastwards as, as El Cajon here. So it is moving very slowly in San Diego County, maybe moving no more than about six miles per year, and it's reached San Marcos, and it is now sort of much stalled out. That is about a distance of 50 miles north from Tijuana. And it's also about 35 miles north of this area that we're going to talk about, the Sweetwater Reserve, which has hundreds and hundreds of naturalized Canary Island date palms in it, which has acted as a massive breeding center for the South American palm weevil. And this map shows you what's going on. Here in 2016, we saw a lot of dead Canary Island date palms in Tijuana, followed a trail of dead palms here 
through southern San Diego County, all the way up here into the Sweetwater Reserve, where we have been monitoring the weevil populations for about six and a half years now. I'm counting the traps for the last time on January 1, and this study will be finished. In the Sweetwater Reserve, not only have we been monitoring weevils every month, we have also been flying a drone every three to four months, counting the number of dead palms in the reserve. And then around the reserve in a north, south, west and east direction, we tagged 521 palms six years ago. Every six months, we drive around all those palm trees and record the numbers of palms that are still alive and those that have died. Right, so what have we found? Here's the reserve. It's a repairing area. The Sweetwater Reservoir is up here to the north, and this water flows out in a westerly direction and enters the sea a few miles across this way. You can see it's quite heavily vegetated with willows and oaks and a heavily urbanized area all around it. The Google Earth map, you can see the Canary Island date palms here. They kind of look like sea anemones rising up above the understory. Here's a palm tree that has been killed by South American palm weevil. And in that reserve, I have 10 traps. The bucket traps, I check them every month, and I count the number of males and females weevils that have entered the bucket trap. The bucket trap has the commercially available aggregation pheromone in it. It has fermenting bait. I use dates, water, and baker's yeast. It's highly attractive to the weevils. And then in the bucket, I have this antifreeze. So when the weevils come in through these holes to check out the bait and the pheromone, they fall into the antifreeze and they drown. Here on the map, on the graph here you can see some green bars that sort of go up and down up and down up and down the first thing i want to point out to you with this is that there are peaks and troughs weevil activity seems to be highest through spring through late summer drops off over winter and then picks up again weevil activity is not consistent from year to year we have had low years and this year 2022 has been an extraordinarily um, heavy year for weevil numbers being captured in these traps in the Sweetwater Reserve. This uh, dotted line here shown in orange is the sex ratio, and you can see that the sex ratio is female biased. The aggregation pheromone that is commercially available, it's a pheromone that is produced by the males. It attracts males and females, but females are more attracted to the aggregation pheromone than males are, and we on average have about 66% of the captured weevils tend to be females because of that. The drone that we've flown across the um, reserve every three to four months has provided data that shows that palm tree mortality has steadily increased over time. So as the drone flies, we set it on a pre-recorded, pre-programmed track. It photographs at the same height and the same locations. You can see healthy and dead palm trees here. We then stitch those photographs together and we make a big map of the reserve. All the palm trees are numbered and then every few months we just check to see whether those numbered palms are alive or dead. The data had not been updated for the last couple of years. The drone has been flown, but has amassed so much data that we haven't had time to um, basically process it all. We have followed 726 palms that have been mapped. Every four months, the drone flies. And you can see up to a couple of years ago, we were at about 45% mortality of those palms. That number is probably closer to 60% now. In the urban areas where we do the driving survey, started in 2016 no palms attacked and killed by the palm weevil as of august 2022 over 60 about 63 percent of those palms 521 of them now have been killed by the south american palm weevil we'll do the survey one more time in february 2023 and then the survey will be concluded as well but an impressive upward trajectory there of palm mortality that's been inflicted by the south american palm weevil on these canary island date palms in the urban environment so how do you protect your palms Without doubt, insecticides are the best method for protecting your palms from palm weevils. And we've done a lot of work recently on evaluating different types of insecticides for palm protection. Without doubt, systemic insecticides that move inside the palm up into the crown and protect that meristematical area from weevil larval attack are the most effective. You can put those products as drenches directly into the crown, soil injections into the soil for the roots to, to, uh, roots to uh, take up. You can inject it or you can put the material on as a trunk paint. So those systemics will move up and into the crown where they will aggregate, concentrate in the meristematic tissue and kill the larvae that are feeding in that area. Contact insecticides can also be used. You'll spray the crown and they'll leave a lethal residue of foliage that will kill the adult weevils that are coming to those palm trees. And as I mentioned, we've wrapped up some insecticide trials. We've just started analyzing those data and some of that work is being published now. 
But basically, the take-home messages are systemic insecticides are probably your best options. They're all neonicotinoids, and those have their own sets of problems, as you're probably familiar with. Now, I've spent some time in Spain and Morocco looking at this problem, and those guys have come up with some rather ingenious ways to deliver insecticides into the crowns. They hook up these hoses, and the material goes straight into the crown with these pumps. And here in Morocco, you can see that the lines have been permanently attached to the palm trees and the treatments that go on every few months, they just hook this uh, permanently installed tube up to one of these pumps here and the material goes up and drenches the crown and spectacular levels of success. This is a highly popular tourist area. This is uh, Cape Spartel in, in Morocco. So you can see at this around this, um, um, a tourist area that we were visiting, looking at the palm trees, that all the palms have these lines running up them, going up into the crown. And every few months, they are treated with those systemic insecticides that are delivered up into the crown. The other thing that they've done is that they have cut these windows and installed these slow release devices, which are driven into the uh, bottom part of the, of the crown here. And that material is released slowly into the crown and supplements the uh, tube applications that are done every few months. So if your palm is attacked by palm weevil and the damage is almost severe enough to have killed it, it is possible to save these palms. This is a palm tree from the driving survey that we were conducting. You can see August 2018 here. I had basically written this palm off and said it'll be dead next time we come back in February. There's just like this tiny little spriglet of growth growing there. Very characteristic damage symptoms, you know, the trunk with just this halo of leaves and practically nothing left in the middle here. Well, he came back in 2019 and it was starting to sprout up. 2019 of August, it was looking great. So the owner had been up here drenching the, the crown with a midocloper that he was basically buying at Home Depot and just sloshing it in the, climbing up a ladder and just dumping a bucket of material in there. In February 2020, August 2020, you wouldn't even know that, that a couple of years ago that palm had been attacked and almost killed. August 2021, he gave up on the treatments. And then by February 2022, well, <laughs> this photo speaks for itself. So take home message here is if you're going to go this route, you are on the insecticide treadmill for life. You give up, the pesticides wane, there's no chemical in the crown, the weevils will come back and kill your palm tree. So palms may be actually able to recover on their own. I was taking this photograph of this carrot-like growth coming out of the top of a palm tree. The owners thought that their palm was dead. They couldn't see this growth from their side of the fence. And um, well, so we followed that. Could it actually survive without any insecticide treatments and completely recover? So you can see the lopsided growth here has gotten a bit bigger here in August of 2021. And unfortunately, by February 2022, the weevils had found that new growth again and pretty much killed it off and that palm tree is well and truly dead this time. So I get asked a lot about traps. You know, we, we want a trap. What sort of traps should we use for monitoring palm weevils in my area? Well, there's basically two choices. These bucket traps that I've used at the Sweetwater Reserve and this new trap that we've been evaluating, the Pacusin trap, which is basically a cone trap that sits on the ground. The traps are loaded with aggregation pheromone, fermenting bait, and in the bottoms of it, we put some of that glycol material antifreeze to drown the weevils that, that come in. Without doubt, this is one of the most crystal clear experiments we have ever run. The Pacusin trap is far more efficient at trapping weevils that are attracted to it. We ran some videography studies and the reasons for this became pretty clear after reviewing thousands of hours of video footage is that when the weevils ascend the Pacusin trap and drop into this hole in the top, they can't get out again. When we look at the videos of the bucket traps, the weevils land on the side of the bucket, walk up the burlap, they go in and out of these holes round and round. They may do this for 30, 40 minutes, and then a lot of them just fly away. They don't stay. But once you're in the Pacusin trap, you can't get out. So baits. So the best bait types that we have tested are using the aggregation lure, dates mixed with water and to that we add a packet of baker's yeast. We looked at other attractive yeasts like fruit yeasts and lager yeasts which are commercially available and they basic they they are attractive but nowhere near as attractive as a packet of baker's yeast going into that potion of dates and water. It really jump starts the fermentation process and the volatiles that come off that fermentation product in combination with the aggregation pheromone is highly attractive to South American palm weevil and baker's yeast is readily available at the supermarket as well. 
So some caveats for traps. Don't hang your traps near palms. The traps may attract the weevils. The weevils may miss the palm, miss, miss the trap and end up attacking your palm tree. The bucket trap will only capture 30% of the weevils that are attracted to it. The percussion trap will trap more than 95% of the weevils attracted to it. Studies have indicated that if the traps are put in full sun, they don't work as well. It's best to have your traps in partial or full shade. We think if the temperatures get too hot in the trap, we measured some of this, the trap temperatures can exceed 60 degrees or 140 degrees Fahrenheit if they're sitting in the sun. This probably reduces pheromone and bait attractiveness. The weevil really doesn't care where the trap is. If it smells the pheromone and it smells the fermenting bait, it'll even go into uh, traps that you hide behind a dumpster at a supermarket. It really doesn't care. So the take home messages for the traps, we recommend that you use the commercially available percussion trap. It is superior to the bucket trap. Um, the bait type with lures will work, but just putting the lure with some fermenting bait, especially the dates and baker's yeast, can really ramp up the levels of attraction and you can catch many more weevils. This may even be an option for control. Mass trapping is a control option in commercial oil um, palm plantations in Costa Rica and commercial date orchards in Israel and the Middle East for a different type of weevil, the red palm weevil. Don't put your traps on the palms. What I am suggesting that if you're worried about weevils being active in your area, you may want to have traps half a mile away from the area of concern. If you catch weevils in those traps, it is highly likely that they will be coming close to the palms that you want to protect. And as I mentioned, the weevils really don't care where the traps are. You can have them sitting in a pile of sand and rocks and the weevils will still come to them. Keep your traps in the shade. Don't do this. This is a fashion island in Orange County. Somebody very, I have to say, I got a hand with them, very innovative, got those percussion traps, which are supposed to be on the ground. You don't hang them because the bottom falls out. Somehow they managed to attach the bottom tray in here so it didn't fall out. Each one of these palm trees had one of these traps in it. They must have been releasing gallons of pheromone into the air. And it's amazing to me that the weevils didn't smell that and fly all the way up from El Cajon <laughs> to Fashion Island in, in Orange County. Whoops, wrong way. Okay, occasionally you may see other weevils in the trap, especially these agave snout weevils. They tend to be much smaller than the South American palm weevil and their rostrums or their beaks tend to be much thicker and more highly curved in comparison to the South American palm weevil. This is a nice photograph of a female. She has no bristles on her snout. Remember the males have those bristles on the snout and that's how you differentiate them. In the traps, you will find weevils that will be heavily infested with these mites. They are not biological control agents. They are saprophytic mites that are simply hitchhiking from palm tree to palm tree on the palm weevil. These mites feed on the rotting plant material inside the crown area after the weevil larvae have destroyed them. Our work on these weevils suggests that there are about three or four species of weevil found uh, mites found on these weevils. At least two of them were not known in California until these weevils invaded. So we may have ended up with multiple invasion events going on here. We got the weevil, and we've probably got a couple of species of phoretic mites that weren't present in California until the weevil arrived. And it is possible in the future, we will end up with red ring nematode, courtesy of South American palm weevil as well. So this beetle is very good at moving other organisms around into new areas where they did not previously exist. Biological control is an option, and this is something we were very excited about. There's a parasitic fly in Brazil that can kill up to 50% of these palm weevil larvae each year. Parasitism ranges from about 30 to 70%, depending on the time of year. The fly larvae get into these pupil cases. They feed on the pre-pupa and the pupa, and you can get up to 18 flies coming out of one South American palm weevil cocoon. That's a great ratio. You kill one weevil, you get 18 flies out. We had funding from the USDA to go and work on this. COVID shut everything down and we have not been able to resurrect that control program. This is of high interest to me at some stage going back down to revisit this and see what we could do with this fly in California for the biological control of South American palm weevil. Okay, so right now we have a new project running. We got a big grant from the California Department of uh, pesticide regulations. We are going to be running an attract and kill program in San Diego County to see if we can control weevils without having to spray and treat every palm tree throughout the urban environment. The concept is very simple. This gel material that's in this basically corking gun that you can squirt out and put onto these palm trees 
this is a dead palm tree in Tunisia where we were testing this against um, South American palm weevil, has the aggregation pheromone in it and the weevils are attracted to it. But what the weevils don't know is that in this inert waxy material is an insecticide. So when the weevils come to investigate the pheromone, they walk over these dollops and they get a lethal dose of the insect contact insecticide. They either drop dead below the tree or if they get a sublethal dose, they fly away, die and don't live as long. So this is something that we are pretty interested in, in using. It will eliminate the needs for those expensive traps. You could put dollops on trees like this, along fences, on lamp, lamp posts. And we have a plan set up where we're going to deploy this material in grids of varying densities throughout San Diego County and then monitor the rates of weevil captures and traps in treated and untreated areas and also monitor the rates of um, Canary Island date palm mortality in treated and untreated areas as well. Okay, we need your help to figure out where this weevil is going in San Diego County and other parts of Southern California. We have a website up which you can go and visit and you can report infested palm trees there. You can load up your contact details, a photograph, GPS coordinates, the street address, any information that you can provide on the locality of those new palm finds is very useful to us. And we're plotting those into a Google Earth uh, map so we can monitor the spread of the weevil within the infested areas, see how far north it's going, how far east it is going as well. So please, um, if you see something, and you can document it, please get that information to us via the website. Uh, you can see it here, or you can scan this QR code. So if you have your phones handy, you can either take a photograph of it or open up your QR scanner on your phone now and scan that and it'll take you to the website. So please do that. I'll give you five seconds. One, two, three, four, or oh, maybe a bit longer, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We had a lot of funding from the USDA, CDFA Specialty Crops, California Date Commission, West Coast Arborists have helped uh, drop palm trees for us to get weevils for our experiments. And this big attract and kill project has been sponsored by the California Department of Pesticide Regulations. We're very excited to get this going early next year. Right, how am I doing on time? I forgot to set my timer. Is anybody there? Yeah, we can't hear you. Oh. Have I been on mute the whole time? You're not on mute, Mark. I'm not. No, Jan is. For oh, oh you're talking to Jan, issue. not me. Oh, my God. So why didn't you tell me I was on mute for the whole no. time? I was just talking <laughs> to myself. <laughs> I can hear you, Jan. Yeah. Yes. Yes. How am I doing think? on time? All right. Um, we're good. We're done. We okay, are going to, um, if you have, uh, thank you, Mark. We appreciate right. that great right. update. Um, if you have a moment, if you can go over to the Q&A and answer any questions that pertain to South American palm weevil, that would be great. Yes, I'll do that right now. Um, Heidi is going to um, pop up some polls real quick. I think because of um, our schedule, we're going to go ahead and skip the 10 minute break. Um, if you know, feel free if you need to take a, a quick personal break, please feel free, but um, we want to keep the presentation we want to keep our, our time slot on on track as much as possible. So um, Heidi, do you want to do those polls real quick and then we'll move on to the next presentation. Yeah, thanks, Jan. Here are the polls. I just launched the first one just really fast. Um, Okay, Crown. Crown. Next one. Yeah, most of you got that right. It was B, Canary Island, Big Palm. Great, thank you. All right. All right. 
So our next uh, speaker uh, is Eric Middleton. He is the Integrated Pest Management Area Advisor for San Diego, Orange, and Los Angeles counties. And he's going to share um, a bit about Asian citrus psyllid, long, long bink, and Mexican fruit fly. Eric? All righty. Thank you for joining us. All right. Does everybody see that? And can everybody hear me? Yes, we're good. Okay, good. <laughs> Silence was unnerving. All right. So um, I have a little bit of a different uh, thing to talk about because um, I'm covering two different pests and also uh, just it's a sort of a bit of a different thing where this is more dealing with um, things that apply to food crops, but then of course also apply um, in urban areas, residential areas. So talking about both Asian citrus psyllid and the Mexican fruit fly. Um, and so just as a bit of an overview of all the things I'm going to be talking about. First, talk about Asian citrus psyllid and Huang Long being identification of the psyllid, uh, the damage that these two can cause together, and then also just a little bit about the economic consequences that can happen. Um, I originally, well, just before I came here to work at UC Quadra Extension was in Florida, working on citrus there. So we had learned a little bit about Asian citrus still in Huang Long Bing that can provide some additional perspective, I think. And we'll talk a little bit about the current situation with ACP and HLB, and then also what will happen going into the future, perhaps. Then we'll spend a bit of time, switch gears, talk about Mexican fruit fly, again, identification of the hosts, the kind of damage it can cause, and then to talk about the current quarantine that's in place and some of the best practices uh, for different people to follow. So Asian citrus psyllid and Huang Long Bing. Um, first off, talking about the insect first, Asian citrus psyllid is abbreviated as ACP. So anytime you see that written down, which I'll be using quite a bit, that stands for Asian citrus psyllid. Uh, Diaphorina citri is a scientific name. And this is a sap feeding insect, feeds on the phloem, it targets the new flush on trees. So basically for all the different life stages, whether that be the eggs, which you can see pictured towards the bottom, um, the nymphs, which are sort of extruding those white, waxy filaments of honeydew outside the back of them, or the adult, which is pictured um, in the upper hand, right hand picture. All of them are going to be on the new flush, the new leaves, the newly growing areas of their different host plants. And they'll feed on all different kinds of citrus. Um, so you can find them essentially on every kind of different citrus with very few exceptions that are perhaps not as susceptible. Um, but then there's also, you can find them on orange jasmine uh, and curry leaf. Curry leaf, interestingly, is actually kind of more of a preferred host for them. Um, potential idea for using them as a trap crop, never really got off the ground. But Asian citrus still on its own causes relatively little damage. Um, they can cause some damage just as any different um, sap feeding pest can. They can cause a sort of notched leaf appearance that you can see in the picture about in the middle. Um, and then also tip dieback from their feeding and the sal saliva they're injecting. They can also cause issues with honeydew and sea mold. But for the most part on its own, ACP is not a particularly big problem. Of course, when it's combined with Huang Long Bing, the disease, it can become a very, very serious issue. So Huang Long Bing abbreviated HLB, also known as greening disease, citrus greening disease, they're basically all interchangeable. It's a bacterium that lives inside the flow of the tree, and it causes a systemic disease um, where all different parts of the tree end up being affected. It's spread by feeding Asian citrus psyllids. Uh, both the adults and larvae can pick it up, but the adults are the ones that are actually moving around, so they'll be the one potentially transferring it from tree to tree. And currently, there is no cure for this disease. Uh, the tree begins to lose roots, it starts to die back, other symptoms will begin to appear. And um, if nothing is done, as the disease progresses, the tree will eventually die. This is especially problematic for younger trees, which are more susceptible. Older ones can persist for a while if they have it, and it's not particularly high bacterial load. But the problem is, of course, that there's no cure for it. Um, in terms of what the disease does to the tree, um, by the name citrus greening disease, that's one of the sort of main symptoms that you can potentially see is where fruit will stay a bit greenish, um, at least about half of it. The flavor is affected, so it's more bitter and just kind of off tasting. Um, this is true even if, say, you're juicing the fruit where you could potentially try to combine it and hide the flavor. It's still a little bit off tasting. And if you're doing fresh fruit or just eating something right off the tree, it's noticeable. Um, they have a crooked midrib oftentimes, so the interior of the fruit uh, will be a little bit distorted. The seeds will be um, distorted, won't be as viable. And then also you'll get a yellowing of the leaves and thicker veins. So when you have yellowing leaves, it tends to be um, asymmetrical in how it appears on the plant as opposed to sort of more symmetrical patterns that can be seen from nutrient deficiencies like zinc deficiency. And then also you'll get leaves uh, with thicker veins that are appearing. So all these symptoms 
um, can point to HLB, although still one of the best ways to actually figure it out is not to eyeball it looking for symptoms, but to actually conduct PCR on the tree, especially because HLB can be extremely damaging and it's not something we want just floating around. But the question is, is that here in California, a lot of people don't really, I don't think, understand how damaging HLB is. Um, there's just sort of sense that, well, it's bad, it's been in other places, but how damaging is it really? And I think we can look to Florida um, for some very important perspective on that, because in Florida, HLB and ACP are widespread, they're completely ubiquitous, and Florida also has a lot of citrus. So this is a great example of when you have a bunch of citrus and you have a bunch of HLB and ACP, what happens? Um, and as I said, I used to be doing work um, in Florida, looking at different insect pests of citrus. So have some personal experience with this. Um, and when we look at citrus production in Florida, I'm going to show you a couple graphs. This first one is the acres of citrus being produced in the state in terms of thousands of acres. So that's on the y-axis. X-axis is the date moving through time. Um, Asian citrus psyllid was present in the state since about 1998, but then Huang Long Bing was introduced in the state around 2005. So the year before that, in 2004, there was approximately 750,000 acres of citrus that were growing in the state. Then Huang Long Bing appears and you can see it drops off. So there's a noticeable immediate decline and then a very steady decline where there's fewer and fewer acres of citrus growing until in 2022, there's about 375,000 acres. So pretty much over the span of those 18 years since the bacteria was introduced to the state of Florida, uh, the number of acres of citrus has been approximately halved. So that's a pretty serious situation, but it's not the full scale of the picture because you can still have trees that are technically acres of citrus that are technically growing fruit, but that are infected with HLB and therefore are far less productive, are far less healthy trees. So a better way of looking at this perhaps is boxes of citrus, how much production is actually taking place. So for a context, one box of citrus is approximately 90 pounds of oranges. On the y-axis, we have boxes of citrus in the millions. X-axis is still the date. In 2004, before the disease was present, there was a production of about 292 million boxes per year. And then here we have HLB as introduced to the state. And there's a very sharp drop off and then an even sharper decline. Um, very, very significant reduction in the amount of citrus that is able to be grown in the state of Florida. So right now in 2022, there's approximately 45.1 million boxes of citrus being produced. So that's about a sixth of the production that there was 18 years ago. So all of this to say that if they become established, ACP and HLB are devastating to citrus. And that is true both, of course, of commercial citrus and was probably more relevant to this group of uh, residential citrus and citrus that's just around um, in urban and suburban areas. So what's happening with Asian citrus psyllid and HLB in California? Well, ACP, the insect, was first found in 2008 and has since become decently widespread in different parts of the state. This is a map from 2019. Um, the areas then kind of yellowish orange towards the bottom of the state are areas where Asian citrus psyllid is considered established. And then up in the green sections, a bit further north in sort of the Central Valley where a lot of commercial citrus production is, that's where ACP has been detected, but isn't necessarily considered to be established in the area. So in Southern California, ACP is essentially beyond eradication without some pretty significant, uh, very, very significant control efforts that would have to take place. Uh, the Central Valley eradication can still be used. Um, and proactive prevention measures are still being used there to try to make sure that the psyllid itself doesn't become established. Unfortunately, also, uh, relatively soon after ACP was found, HLB has been found in the state starting in 2012. And that's mostly around sort of Los Angeles, Orange County areas. Unfortunately, so far, it has not yet become a widespread issue. And so in terms of where it is, looking at the disease itself in Southern California, the areas in blue are quarantine zones. Um, and then the areas in green, the little green dots, are specific places where HLB itself has been detected. So you can see this is around Los Angeles, Orange County, a bit over to Riverside, and then down towards the bottom, um, there's a quarantine section around Oceanside, uh, which is in northern San Diego County. So there's that big Orange County hotspot where a lot of the different uh, trees that have been infected with HLB have been found. And this table also demonstrates that pretty well. So this is from about a month ago. So it's pretty current data. Um, you have the region over on the far left, the number of sites or different locations in which um, HLB positive trees or ACP were found, the number of trees itself, and then the number of Asian citrus psyllid that were infected with HLB. So Los Angeles County has a couple hundred of the trees. Orange County, as you can see, is the one where there's the most 
going on thousands of sites, thousands of trees, um, hundreds of ACP that have been found uh, with the disease. Riverside, there's a couple, San Bernardino's a couple. And then as we said, in San Diego County, there's a little bit of a section with that quarantine zone around Oceanside, but it's much more minor. And you can really tell by looking at this map that in terms of HLB in California, it's been mostly confined to residential areas. And this is reinforced if we look at that um, quarantine area around Oceanside. So here, if the quarantine area is now in red and the yellow, all those little yellow dots are areas with commercial citrus production. So as you can see from this, there's very little commercial citrus actually in the same general area where HLB has been found. And that's generally true across the state where commercial citrus has been mostly spared from having HLB present, even though the insect ACP is present throughout much of Southern California. So that's very fortunate economically speaking, because if you remember the graph from Florida, it can be very, very devastating um, when it actually hits uh, commercial fruit production. So, What's being done uh, for controlling ACP and HLB in California? Fortunately, as we said, the damage to the citrus industry remains relatively low. Um, and then also writ large, the damage to um, residential citrus is also decently low, although more HLB is being found in residential areas. Area-wide treatments are still a pretty effective way that is being utilized to try to make sure that um, psyllid numbers stay pretty low. So basically just make sure you're applying treatments all at the same time, all across a region. So you uniformly try to tamp down on the numbers of Asian citrus psyllids. For the most part, you're doing broad spectrum insecticides maybe two to three times a year, trying to target times when there's flush on the trees. So the psyllids are going to be the most active. That's when they're going to be actually feeding. Um, different things like pyrethroids, um, some neonicotinoids can be used for things like this. Also, we've been releasing Tamarixia radiata. Uh, Mark Hoddle has done quite a bit of work on this, um, looking into this parasitoid, which can be released preys on the um, Asian citrus psyllid nymphs and seems to be more effective than it has been in Florida, where Florida is like relatively low single digits efficacy in terms of how many of the Asian citrus psyllid nymphs are parasitized. Here, it's significantly higher. Um, so it's more, I think, around like the teens or so, but I'm sure Mark could provide a more direct number. So Tamarixia radiata being released seems to be more effective here and is helping to keep Asian citrus psyllid numbers lower. Also, you can promote different natural enemies, which can help keep uh, Asian citrus psyllid numbers down as well. So the hoverflies, the oblique streak tails, um, you can attract them by planting things like alyssum in and among uh, citrus areas, um, or just having that say in a front yard or something. If you have an area where there's pollen or attractive things for these hoverflies, their larvae then feed on the Asian citrus psyllid nymphs that can eat quite a few of them at any given time. So they're pretty effective predators. And generally speaking, if you want both the parasitoids and the predators to be more effective, you try to control ants because things like Argentine ants will get up inside the trees. They will farm the um, Asian citrus psyllid nymphs for the honeydew that they produce, and they'll fight off parasitoids and natural enemies. So for the most part, if you want the biocontrol to be working well, make sure you're also controlling the ants. And then of course, in terms of what's being very effective, quarantines are occurring when HLB is found. Trees are being removed. Um, then there's an additional uh, process where properties around there are surveyed. There's mandatory treatments. The quarantine is put in place. Um, these are pretty effective so far, it seems, at helping to keep uh, HLB at low levels in the state. And additionally, there's some ad additional evidence that both ACP and HLB could be more limited in their spread in California because of the way the environment works here. So the ideal egg laying temperature for Asian citrus psyllid is about 77 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you think about what the weather is usually like in Florida, it very frequently is in that range of it's kind of pretty warm, but not too hot, not too cold. So that's probably why ACP has done quite well in Florida. But the thing is, is that if it gets too hot above about 93 degrees Fahrenheit, ACP lifespan starts to drop. And at the same time, their fecundity also drops. So when it's too warm outside, as it is in many places in California that grow citrus or where citrus is present, um, at least in some parts of the year in the summer, it can get pretty warm. And so that means that the ACP isn't gonna be doing nearly as well in those situations. Additionally, if it gets too cold, below about 60 degrees Fahrenheit, ACP fecundity also drops and development takes much longer. So in California, there's kind of a bunch of different places 
where it will either get too hot and or too cold for ACP to do particularly well, where in Florida, that's not nearly the case so often. So it seems that ACP isn't doing as well in California because of temperature ranges. And the same is also true of the disease, HLB, because HLB does best in constant warm, but not hot weather. So when there's high summer temperatures, this reduces bacterial counts both inside the plants themselves and inside the psyllids who could potentially be vectoring the disease. And additionally, the higher temperatures reduce these uh, psyllids ability to pick up and subsequently transmit the disease to new plants. So all this to say that there are certainly hints that both ACP and HLB will do worse here in California than it would do in Florida. That being said, this isn't something to hang your hat on and say, look, we don't need to worry about this. The environment is gonna protect us from it. Um, but what it does seem to indicate is that uh, both of them are probably not gonna be doing as well here. And that also helps to explain why um, Asian citrus psyllid and HLB haven't exploded rapidly in California the same way that they have done in places like, say, Florida. So a little bit of summary of all of that. ACP and HLB have been introduced to California, unfortunately, because they can cause significant damage if they become endemic, as they did in Florida. It's widespread in Southern California, but the disease itself is limited to still relatively few areas. Prevention and vigilance seem to be doing a good job in helping to keep the situation in check, doing those area-wide treatments um, and really trying to keep on top of quarantines and removing infected trees. And as I said at the end, there are hints that California may be a less favorable environment for both ACP and HLB. However, continued vigilance is going to be very important moving forward to make sure that this doesn't become a bigger issue. So. With that, we're now gonna switch gears um, and talk a little bit about another invasive pest, which is also under quarantine, um, and that is the Mexican fruit fly. So first off, what is the Mexican fruit fly? Um, I'm gonna be abbreviating it as MEXFLY, so if you see that in writing, that's what we're talking about. Anastrepha ludens, it is originally native to Central America and Mexico, as the name also suggests. Um, and just to make sure, when we talk, talk about fruit flies, oftentimes people think of the little red-eyed flies that you'll find buzzing around your compost container or maybe inside if you've left your fruit out for a bit too long. That's not what these are. Um, they're a different type of fly. They're much bigger, so they're a light orange color and approximately one centimeter long, so they're maybe a little bit bigger than your average house fly. They have three whitish stripes or yellowish stripes on their back on the thorax, and they have really pretty striking eyes. So bright iridescent eyes, which are either green, sometimes red or purple. Pictures don't really do it justice. They're very uh, distinctive if you see them in person. And then also female mex flies have this distinctive long ovipositor. So it kind of resembles a long blunt stinger. Only females have it, males don't. It's used as an egg laying organ. Um, and then another characteristic thing about this species of fruit fly is that they have these clear wings with sort of V and S shapes in a bit darker sections on the wings itself. So you can kind of make it out here. Um, some flies, you can see it a bit more than others, but basically just they have these kind of wavy patterns that are translucent and a little bit darker um, that do resemble both a V and an S shape. Here's a picture of one of the larvae. You're not likely to see them too much. They're kind of small, white, maggotish things, much like uh, many other different fly larvae, so very hard to identify based on that. And the pupae similarly are pretty nondescript, kind of brown, round, cigar-shaped things. So when you're looking at mex flies, you're almost certainly going to be identifying them from the adult stage. In terms of their life cycle, female mex flies will lay their eggs under the skin of fruit, the eggs hatch, the larvae then burrow into the fruit, begin to consume sections of it from the inside. So it's the larvae and eggs that are on the fruit themselves. The larvae will then exit the fruit, drop to the ground where they will then pupate in the soil, and then they emerge as adults later on. So this entire life cycle um, here in Southern California, it can basically happen continuously. So it doesn't necessarily stop when it gets colder. In warm weather, so say during the summer, it's gonna take mm, around 30-ish days. And then when it gets to cooler weather, it can take 100 days or maybe even a little bit longer. All of it's very temperature dependent, but they can reproduce year round in an environment that we have here in Southern California. In terms of hosts, they can go after quite a bit of different things. They'll go after most different types of citrus. Um, so lemons, limes, oranges, but interestingly, both Eureka and Lisbon lemons are not uh, one of the preferred hosts of Mexican fruit fly. So they can also go after avocados. So both citrus avocados, very common plants um, that are grown down here, both as crops and then just are also usually around in people's backyards, citrus more than avocados. Avocados can be favorable hosts except for Haas avocados. So that's a good sign for growers because Haas avocados are very frequently grown. 
Um, Haas avocados are not an appropriate host when they're on the tree. However, if they're taken off the tree and are sitting for a while, then they become more likely to potentially be used by the fruit fly as a host. But when they're on the tree, they seem to not be an issue. Also, lots of other fruits, basically, if you can think of almost any soft skin fruit, it's probable that the mex fly will be able to use it as a host. Apples, pears, plums, we start getting into more of the tropical subtropical fruits like pomegranate, passion fruit, guava, mango, persimmon, all of those are appropriate hosts for mech fly development. And then additionally, stuff we might not normally think of, uh, different nuts and coffee. So the picture, I'm holding some coffee cherries in the background, um, and they can also serve as hosts for mech fly. So things like cashew nuts and coffee are also appropriate hosts for mech fly to develop on. And a full list is available um, at aphis.usda.gov. So you can check it out there, or there's also a link at the end of the presentation that you can take a look at and verify that, you know, whatever you might be looking at, it could or could not be a host for them. But pretty much everything other than Eureka and Lisbon lemons and host avocados, if it's a fruit, they're likely to be on it. Damage, we talked a little bit about this before. The larvae will feed on the inside of the fruit, they'll form tunnels as they go throughout the entire thing, and they will cause damage on their own, but then there's also secondary infections that occur inside the damaged tissue. And the combination of this means that the fruit is pretty severely damaged, it'll start to spoil, decay. That's a pretty serious problem if you have a fruit tree at home, that's not something you wanna be eating, also it'll have you full of little maggots crawling around. And then of course for growers, it's a very serious problem, you can no longer sell it. There's a lot of potential economic damage that could occur in California from this, about $2.5 billion in gross value for the crops themselves uh, that are being grown that could be affected by Mexfly. So Mexfly has the potential to be very highly damaging in Southern California. But then of course, there's also just the very large number of residential fruit trees, citrus and all these other uh, subtropical fruits that we've talked about. That's a really nice thing about Southern California. You can grow a whole bunch of things like this and lots of people do. So there's a lot of things besides just um, commercial food growing operations that could be affected if Mexfly becomes more widespread. So that brings us to the current quarantine for Mexfly. And of course, this is designed to prevent the spread of Mexfly and eradicate any Mexflies that are present in the area because it's not normally found here in California. So in August 2022, between the 2nd and the 22nd, six uh, adult Mexflies and one larvae were found, which is more than enough to trigger a quarantine taking place. This covers 77 square miles in Valley Center, which is down in San Diego County. And inside that area, growers, packers, people who harvest and ship fruit all have to comply with new additional rules to make sure that Mexfly doesn't spread. This map on the right here um, will be updated as the quarantine evolves, which hopefully it doesn't, um, but the area can expand. It's basically based on five square miles around wherever, or excuse me, a five mile radius around any place that Mexflies have been detected. And treatments are being put out to eradicate the Mexflies and um, the quarantine is expected if no mex flies are found to last until at least June 2023. And we'll go over in, in a little bit more detail some of that as well. So there's both governmental control measures and then there's um, grower measures that are being done to try to prevent the spread of mex fly. We'll start first by what is the government doing? Um, CDFA will go in and remove fruit um, from all properties within 100 meters of a mex fly detection. So all the different places that mex flies were found, 100 meters around, they'll remove all the fruit, make sure that there are fewer hosts for the flies to be using. Additionally, they'll apply an insecticide application of spinosad to all properties within 200 meters of any mex fly detection. And then the part that I think is much more interesting, um, they'll do these very large sterile male releases. So uh, they're breeding hundreds and hundreds of thousands, millions of mex flies uh, where the males are sterile. And these sterile males will then be released from airplanes at a rate of 250,000 of them per square mile per week in an area that I believe is 43 square miles around each mex fly detection. So it's a huge number of flies that are being released. Um, and as you can see from this picture on the right, this is one of those sterile males. It's seen under a UV light and it has a little spot on its forehead, uh, which is fluorescent paint, so that um, when traps are put out to monitor for new mex flies, if you're finding a bunch of mex flies that have a little spot of paint on their head, you know that those are the sterile ones that have been released. They're not the ones you need to be worrying about. So that's a pretty neat way that the uh, uh, CDFA is also using to help try to control Mexfly on a wide scale. And I should also mention, I guess, in case it isn't clear, the goal of this is that when you have this many sterile males out there, any female Mexfly 
flies will mate with the sterile males, will be unable to reproduce offspring, and the population just sort of fiddles out because they're just inundated with sterile males, and they can never find a non-sterile male in order to mate with. For the growers and packers, they have some control measures on their own that are being required by CDFA. Basically, you need to be applying insecticide applications approximately every week, at least one life cycle of the Mexican fruit fly before harvesting any fruit. Um, and that can be both mal it can be mild malathion or it can be spinosad, depending on if you want to be organic or if you aren't an organic grower. And the insecticide is combined with a fruit fly bait, uh, which is attractive to the flies. So they come in, land on it, uh, and then subsequently die. Treatments are being applied on the exterior of groves and then about every uh, six to 10 trees more on the interior. And there's also just CDFA compliance agreements that have to be signed and adhered to for anyone who wants to harvest, pack, or ship fruit inside of the quarantine area. So we talked a little bit about this, bit about this but how long will the quarantine last? Well, it's all based on the life cycles of the mex fly and if there are any new mex fly detections. So the quarantine ends after four full mex fly life cycles, assuming there are no new mex fly detections. If there are no new mex flies detected, if you end up doing the math on that, because the life cycle changes according to temperature, the quarantine will end approximately in June, 2023. Hopefully that will be the case. However, if new mex flies are detected, then the quarantine resets and lasts an additional four life cycles from the most recent detection. And all of this is likely to be effective. The quarantine is likely to work quite well because this is not the first time this has happened. The quarantines have been effective in the past. Mex fly has been introduced numerous times uh, into San Diego County. The last time it happened was in 2003. And at that point, it was actually a harder quarantine. There were more mech flies that were being found. It was a bigger infestation than what we currently see. But even then, with that more difficult quarantine, these measures were effective um, and were able to exterminate the mech flies present in the area. So this is something that's probably not going to be a sort of long-term problem, but it's certainly something to be aware of now um, and to be um, cognizant of when looking at all these different plant species that could be hosts to the Mexican fruit fly, especially if you're inside the quarantine area. What should the public do? What should different people be aware of about this? If they're inside the quarantine area, one of the biggest things is make sure that people don't move fruit or host plants from inside the quarantine area to the outside of them. Exceptions are if the fruit has been frozen, processed, canned, cooked in some way that would kill any eggs or larvae that are present on them. But certainly no moving of host plants or fresh fruit from inside to outside. For waste fruit, it needs to be disposed of correctly, basically double bagged and thrown away and not composted. If it's composted, it could provide additional habitat for mex flies to reproduce in. And then also, hopefully people are just understanding of the current quarantine practices. If CDFA needs to come onto a property, apply insecticides or remove fruit, they're aware of that and understanding of that. And additionally, that they're understanding of the fact that growers have to be adhering to a large number of additional rules, have to be applying insecticides. It's basically a difficult time for everyone who's involved with it. And hopefully the public is made aware of that and keeps that in mind uh, when dealing with this. In general, if they're found, report any mex fly sightings to the CDFA. The pest hotline is listed here. It'll also be listed at the very end of the presentation. And also make sure that people are aware of this, especially if they're inside the quarantine area, that they're aware of what's happening, what they should do. But then also outside of it, that people are aware of what mex flies are like, um, the host that they could be on, and are able to identify them in case this infestation does spread and the quarantine has to move out, because we certainly don't want this to become an established pest here in Southern California. Um, and this has kind of been a theme from uh, many of the different talks that you've heard today about not bringing agricultural products or say wood, firewood, from areas um, into new places, especially if those things have not been inspected. Um, that's how a lot of invasive pests like this spread around. That's been a theme that's been heard in a number of talks previous to mine. But basically, invasive pests enter California on a regular basis, and residential areas frequently will abut agriculture, as you can see in this background picture. They'll abut natural areas. It means that if residents bring stuff in, it can really start to spread and become a very serious problem for many other people around them. Um, many invasive species will oftentimes start in residential areas. So it is really important that people don't bring in agricultural products or be moving wood or other things like that. This applies both to mex fly and to many other invasive species as I'm sure you are all aware. So summary of all of that, Mexfly is a serious pest of many fruit species. Citrus is a big one. Avocado is another one that can be problematic here, although again, not Haas avocado. Recently, they were found in Valley Center in August, resulting in a quarantine, which will potentially last until June 2023. Hopefully it's only that long. Eradication efforts are currently underway. They've been effective in the past. There's no reason to think they won't be effective again this time, especially if uh, people will keep their eyes open for next flies um, and help spread the word. In general, try to keep track of the quarantine. Make sure you're aware of where it is um, and report any next fly sightings to the CDFA. 
And of course, as we said, don't move uninspected agricultural products or things like firewood for all of the different invasive pests that have been talked about today. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, listed below are a bunch of resources for ACP, some additional resources about MexFly, and then listed again as that pest hotline. Wonderful. Thank you, Eric. We appreciate the update on both these pests and the situations. Mm -hmm. um, Heidi, do you want to quickly run through the polls real quick, and then maybe we have time for a, you know, maybe one question? And then, Eric, afterwards, maybe you can look at the Q&A panel and, and address mm -hmm. anything for you. Thanks. Yeah, so I've launched the first poll question. Right, and C is correct. Great. Just launch the second question. D is correct. ACP feed on new leaves. Great. Thank you, Heidi. Let me see if there's a question for. Um, here's one. Eric, does the peptide treatment that was announced in 2020 have any efficacy against HLB? Yeah, that's one I've heard about a little bit. My understanding is that it seemed to work pretty well in the lab. There were some field trials which seemed promising, and then it hasn't really been verified to be effective in broader scale uh, trials. I haven't heard anything new about it, um, but it did seem promising um from early reports but it doesn't seem like at least yet that it's something that can be actually useful um for controlling hlb in the field okay thank you so i just want to let everybody know before we move on to the next presenter that um we will share any questions that aren't addressed um in the q a we will share those with our presenters and get answers and um, they will be included in our follow-up email to you. Um, and the same with anything that happens to be popping up in, in chat um, that we can address. We will do that during our follow-up. Eric, thank you. We appreciate um, you joining us today and all that great information. We're gonna go ahead and go on to our next presentation. Kim Carella is a forest pest specialist with the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection. And she's going to be sharing some information with us about uh, the CDFA pest rating um, program and the infested and infested wood management. So Kim, do you want to? How are you? Can you see that okay? Yep. Thank you. Welcome. You're welcome. Thanks, Jan. And Eric's talk tied right into um, the, the current and what can be done with CDFA with these pest ratings when a new invasive pest is brought into California. So today I'm gonna to go over these pest ratings from CDFA, what they include um, and how they're conducted and what the ratings mean, and then go into invested firewood management, which you've kind of heard about throughout this whole presentation, our talk today. So let me see here, come on. So uh, many of you know about CDFA, their mission statement is um, seen here is to serve citizens of California by promoting safe and healthy food, um, enhance global trade through effective management, sound science, and um, commitment to environmental stewardship. So they do this by a variety of goals to see in the bottom. And one of the goals that they, um, that I'm gonna talk about today with the Pest ratings is to protect against the invasion of exotic pests and diseases. So they do this 
by um, having these test ratings. And this is a code that's mandated in their um, food and egg code that says the department shall prevent the introduction and spread of injurious insects and animal pests and pet diseases or noxious weeds. So that code um, requires that a pest policy be created that recognizes that organisms vary in the potential and actual harm to California's agriculture environment. So they want to determine a rating that can determine the overall pest significance that will um, enable CDFA to apply the appropriate pest prevention activities, um, what level they need to be applied at, and when and where those activities should be conducted. So the um, pest ratings are an action-oriented rating system. They're really to inform the county egg commissioners and other parties um, to a particular pest that is of interest. Um, in the agriculture or the environment. And they do this through having, going through a California pest rating proposal. And through that, depending on what rating that's given, there's a variety of mitigating measures and other treatments that can be taken um, to try to prevent the entry of these pests if they're in the state to eliminate and isolate infestations or to prevent further spread. And these can be done um, some examples of those is quarantine, as Eric just mentioned with the medfly, eradication, control, or suppression activities. So how does CDFA define a pest? A pest it means any of the following things um, that is liable to or dangerous or detrimental to the agricultural industry of the state. So any infectious, transmissible, or contagious disease of a plant, any form of animal life or any form of vegetable life. There's a lot of different things that can um, constitute a pest according to CDFA. And then, so when they do find, um, if, a, if a new pest is found, they wanna go through this pest rating process. And that starts with um, a California pest rating proposal form. And that can be done by any interested party or organization that wants to propose a change or um, propose a new pest rating and submit it to the department. So when that starts out, a new pest is usually given um, a Q or a Z temporary pest rating. Q is an orga organism that usually requires an action A uh, pest rating and determination and mitigating measures. And I'll get into that in a little bit. And Z is usually applied for, um, for weeds, but that is usually an organism that's for commonly occurred and generally distributed in California. So when these temporary pest ratings are given, the department will complete a review of these pest ratings within one year, the new pest ratings, these um, temporary pest ratings, and then they review all the other pest ratings every two years to determine if these, if these existing pest ratings are still valid. So it's really important they make sure all the pest ratings that are given are current and up to date and still relevant for all the pests. So there's a lot of categories that they um, have these proposals for um, as seen here. They they categorize them as insect, mites, and earthworms. Nematodes are separate. Plant pathogens, snails and slugs, invertebrate pests, and weeds. There's a lot of different varieties of um, of these pest ratings that are received by CDFA. So I'm going to go into what um, these pest rating proposal forms comprises of, and how and what kind of information that they uh, want to have. So in these forms, there's six um, sections that need to be filled out. The first one is just goes over the initiating event. Um, we want to identify the organism and what triggered this pest rating proposal. And the second one is the history and status. So this is the area where you want to um, evaluate, where you want to um, talk about the biology of this pest um, that you're proposing, uh, where it's been found in the world, um, any official controls in other parts of the states where it's been found or in other countries where it's been found in California and any of the interceptions where it's been found in California. And then you get into the consequences of the introduction. This is where the scores begin. Each There's um, five or six subsections underneath here and each of them receive a score of a low, medium or high. And those are all uh, tallied up in that um, is part of the final score that designates the pest, the pest rating. So underneath the consequences of introduction, 
to talk about the climate host interaction. So really this, um, you wanna evaluate if the host, if the pest would have suitable host and climate established in California. And then, so if they do, we see the high, if there's a low climate that this pest will, will um, can establish, and if there's a low score of one, up to a high score of three. And you wanna go over the known host range, um, evaluate the host range of this pest. Do they have um, a limited host range? Do they have a wide host range? Oops. And then go over the pest reproductive potential. Um, you wanna evaluate the natural and artificial dispersal potential for this pest. Um, does it have a high reproductive host rate or high, a high reproductive rate and dispersal potential or a low in those different categories and they receive a rating as well. By the way, the economic impact and there's different um, sections that are underneath here. Does it, um, does it lower the crop yield? Does it trigger loss of markets? That sort of thing. And that receives a score as well. And then the environmental impact. This is where you evaluate the environmental impact of the pest. As, for example, will it impact biodiversity? Will it impact threatened and endangered species? Does it impact um, cultural practices? So once all those scores are added up, that totals the consequences of introduction into California. Um, and then the fifth part of this proposal rating form is called the post-entry distribution and survey information. This receives a score of zero to three. Um, and it's really um, to evaluate the known distribution um, in California, and they only use um, official records identified by experts, so in voucher specimens. So you really want to have anything that's identified by CDFA um, or county A commissioners, because um, those count as official records. So they count all those up. If it's none, then you don't have a score. Not a zero, obviously, all the way up to three that is highly spread um, in California. And the final score, um, you subtract 45. And that's the final score. And that goes into the pest rating and what which rating this pest is going to receive. And there's other um, things you put on. You want to talk about the final score, the uncertainty. You want to differentiate risk from uncertainty than any conclusions and rating justification. Um, also references and responsible parties also listed. So when you have that final score, um, a low score is usually five to eight points. That we usually receive the pest rating of C or D, medium, um, we see the pest rating of C or B, and high is A or B, and it's up to the person rating of CDFA rating these pest proposal forms. This is the basis for usually what these scores um, equivalent to for the pest ratings. So what are the, what do the pest ratings mean? Um, uh, a rating is an organism that's known economics important and is subject to state or commissioner for its action. So they have regulatory authority to do eradication, quarantine regulation, containment, rejection, or other holding actions. Example of these are sudden of death, animal dashboard, rain ring nematode, and some ambrosia beetles. Um, and the B ratings are an organism also known of economic importance, but are limited in distribution in California. So there are some regulatory actions that can be taken but it's really up to the discretion of the individual county A commissioner. And some of these um, are GSOB, the Shaho Borer, and Mediterranean Oak Borer. And a C rating is an organism that are commonly occur in, and generally distributed in California. So there's really not any state enforced actions except for outside of nurse, except for in nurseries, um, except if it does escape to retard that spread. So examples of this are yellow star thistle, um, and banned elm bark beetle. And D-rated pests are usually had no economic importance um, and they're usually beneficial organisms. So there's no regulatory actions that are taken there. So within 30 days of completion of these uh, pest rating proposal forms, there's a, a 45 day public comment period, um, which the department will respond to any of these comments in 30 days. Currently, there is um, a pest rating proposal for Fusarium carotium, which is a fungus, a pathogen carried by the Crucio shothole beetle, part of the invasive shothole borer beetle complex that John talked about in the first talk of this uh, session. 
and that is proposed pest rating of B on a comment period is through December 17th. So those comments can be published on the website and the department will respond to those within 30 days. Um, and those ratings are published on the CDFA website once they're final. And these ratings are really mainly geared towards agriculture and their impact. So there is some limits in quantifying the impact of non-agricultural hosts. So these CDFS paid, CDFA pest ratings are really good at assigning potential and actual harm um, to these invest that these invasives may cause, as well as the, as well as as well as the mitigating regulations that can use to limit their spread. But invasives can be spread in a variety of ways. And one of the common ways that we've heard many times through this talk is through firewood. So firewood is really an ideal vector. Um, it's really the cause for accidental long distance transport of these invasive pests and pathogens. Um, when these are introduced, they change ecosystems. Um, and so there's been a lot of, lot of information, a lot of trying to educate the public about not moving firewood. There's a national campaign of Don't Move Firewood is seen on the right here. Um, California has a firewood task force, and really they're trying to enforce um, the use of local firewood. You really don't want to move it. Um, you really don't want to move it offsite of your property, but if you do, you want to keep it within 50 miles at the very most, but really 10 miles is ideal um, because you don't want to move those, those pests any further than you need to. You're not really, you can't be 100% sure that, those, that wood is not infested. So the um, there's a firewood map on the Don't Move Firewood. It's really good. You can click on any of these uh, states and it'll give you the information, any current information on firewood. You click on California. It talks about um, that California for hips firewood being brought into the state if it's from an infested area with a harmful tree pest. It talks about CDSA uh, border stations and inspect those wood. And also it gives regulation or gives information on the California web resources and any pest specific information. So you see it has GSAW, pitch canker, ML dash bore, basin shot hole bores. Um, and up here under web resources, you talk about any quarantines or regulations that are in place. Um, Orange County Parks has a firewood policy. Yosemite National Park has firewood recommendations, that sort of thing. But it's a really good website to know where if you're going anywhere or what state you're in, what the current um, firewood management regulations are and the pests you need to be aware of in your state. So I mentioned that Orange County Parks has a firewood policy. They brought that out because they were really concerned about the movement of GSOB and the base of Shaho Bore. So they no longer allow bringing firewood unless it's commercially produced and heat treated and labeled pest free is safe to move. So um, this heat treated is a little different than kiln treated. Um, the makers of the heat treated firewood are legally compliant. The firewood is heated to a certain core temperature. So they heat the temperature up to 60 degrees Celsius for 60 minutes. And that's um, approved because of treatment for ML dash borer. So that kills, effectively kills ML dash borer. And the USDA AFIS PPQ came up with that, um, that uh, rating for that. So they want those, the wood you brought in is heat treated. Kiln treated means that there's not um, a, um, a standard for kill, treating, kill treatment. The kill, kill treated wood could be um, heated for a variety of temperatures, a variety of time, and that core may not reach that 60 degrees degree Celsius for that whole hour. So they really want to have heat treated wood. Um, so to manage the wood properly, you really need to know what pest or pathogen is in your area. If you've heard throughout this whole seminar, um, Southern California, insects that we are concerned about that moves on um, uh, firewood are GSOB and it's a shaho bore. So some of the infested wood management that we can do is choose firewood sources that are close to where you're using the wood. Really don't transport wood because um, you might import those diseases into new areas. We always see um, uh, trucks on the side of the road selling firewood, or if your neighbor has, as Bea mentioned, your neighbor has a tree that falls down, um, a couple of trees, you don't know why they fall down, but you're being nice and give it to your neighbor. You could be unintentionally moving um, GSOB or shaho bore or something else. So try not to do that if possible, unless it's treated properly. Uh, green waste is also a potential problem. 
as they mentioned, this is infested with invasive shaho borer, as seen by the galleries and the, and the um, pathogen here. So these can start new infestations very easily. And this was shown earlier, but this is a map of the ghost bad oak borer distribution. And it was introduced into San Diego from Arizona, where it really hung around here. GSOB, as they mentioned, doesn't spread very far, but these outlier areas over here in LA, I mean, in Riverside and San Bernardino and up in LA and Orange County, were most likely um, spread through firewood because insect does not fly that far. So you can have these, you get these um, larger distribution of the population that you normally wouldn't get from natural spread. Another way to manage the best of firewood, as I mentioned, is debarking the wood when practical because a lot of pests reside in that bark. And then you want to manage that bark properly. You don't want to just throw it away off to the side, especially with GSOB or for bark beetles. A lot of insects can emerge still in that bark if that bark is removed. So, but if you do remove this bark, especially for GSOB and bark beetles, and that bark is treated, you can use that wood. You can treat it. I mean, you can burn it, you can stack it um, and keep it. And it's for those insects, you no longer have a threat. But you also want to know what insect you're dealing with because this will not work for shaho borer that does penetrate into the xylem. So this will, so debarking will not work for shaho borer. But it is a good effective management strategy, though it does take a lot of time and effort to, to um, debark the wood. Another way which you can do is you can screen or tarp unused water bark. You want to make sure it's tarp or um, screen and for, until it's seasoned, which takes about a year and a half to two years. Um, you can tarp it, as that was mentioned before. These tarps are, are, are fairly good. They're usually resistant, but they do um, break down over time and they do split. So you want to make sure, constantly check your tarp and make sure that there are no holes or tears in it. Um, this aluminum screening is preferred. That is more durable, it's a little more expensive, but durable and you can reuse it over the time. Um, and that has less chance of tearing. Also chipping infested wood to less than one inch will eliminate most tree killing pests. Um, that chipping size can vary depending on the insect, but one inch will, will as I mentioned, will eliminate both stuff. But with G-saw, you only have to chip to one inch. And I know a lot of chippers don't go to that one inch um, level. So any, any chipping is better than no chipping, but if you can get to one inch, that's better than nothing. Um, you can season your wood for two years before transporting it. Um, most tree killing pests or diseases that are in the wood when they're felled are no longer present after a couple of years. So the seasoned wood is actually more beneficial um, than burning um, wet wood. Seasoned wood uh, burns hotter and cleaner, so it's more effective um, heating. And um, yeah, and if you don't want to wait two years to season the wood, as I mentioned before, you can heat treat the infested wood. Um, to an internal temperature of 60 degrees Celsius for a minimum of 60 minutes. Also, um, as Bea mentioned, you don't want to um, stack firewood by living trees. Um, these people stack their firewood by this healthy black oak or live oak, um, live oak, I believe. And then it was infested with an insect, probably g -sob, and then this tree became infested. So you don't really want to Stack your tree, stack your firewood near healthy trees just in case they are infested. Um, if you do, you want to make sure you treat them properly. So uh, to wrap up, um, firewood is really an important vector of the potential forest pests. A lot of private vehicles transport this, you know, to go camping or for home heating. Commercial vehicles can transport these insects hundreds of hundreds of miles. Um, this is what caused the introduction of GSOB. Arizona into California, most likely. And really, you want to limit that movement of firewood to less than 50 miles, but you really want to keep it on your property or less than 10 miles if possible. Um, and then, if you do have firewood infested, you want to manage it properly. Know what insect you're dealing with, um, what disease you're working with, so you can manage that wood properly so you can use it for your home heating or that sort of thing. Um, so you can debark it, treating that bark as you as that's debarked. You can solarize it for two years, chip it. Um, season it, or you can, and please don't store it, as I mentioned before, near healthy oak, healthy trees, because those can transmit um, insects or diseases onto those healthy trees. So once you treat it properly, that wood can be used, can be used safely. So with that, um, I know it was quick, but that's all that I have, and I'll take any questions.
Jan, we can't hear you again. Oh, you can't hear me? Jan. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. I was like, oh, no. No, you're good. Kim. Can you hear me now? Yes. I'm not sure what's happening. Um, but thank you, Kim. That was that was a great update and reminder. Um, let's do a couple of quick polls and then I do have a question for you. All right, I just launched the first poll. Okay. All right, most of you answered correctly. It is R. All right, is there another? All right, I just uh, gave the second poll too. That's correct. Everyone got that one right. And then also I'm going to post in the chat box a link to our feedback survey. We'd really appreciate it if everyone could complete that for us. Um, posting it right. right now. Great, thank you. Um, Kim, a quick question. I understand that CDFA will confiscate firewood at its inspection stations if pests are found on it, such as spotted lanternfly eggs. But does CDFA also have ability to assess fines on those transporting it? Um, as far as I know, CDFA does not um, have fines for people transporting it. They'll just confiscate that wood, but I do need to double check on that. I know there are um, some penal codes that can be um, that does have fines associated with it, but as far as I know, CDFA just compensates that wood. I don't believe they have fines for those transporting it. Okay, great. All right, thank you. So our next presenters are from the County of San Diego Agriculture Weights and Measures Department. We have Brian Pennington and Henderson Sood to discuss um, the most current um, pesticide applicator regulations. Hey, that's me. There hey. you go. All right. Hello, hello. Hi. Okay. All right. Thank you for joining screen. us. Yep, go ahead. Here we go. All right. Can you guys see that? Yes, we're good. All right. Cool. So, um, Thank you all for attending. Um, my name is Brian, Brian Pennington. I've been an ag inspector at the county level for about five and a half years now, uh, four years in San Diego, one and a half years in Riverside. Um, I'll let Henderson introduce himself when it's time. Uh, first, I wanna thank you all for attending and let me start by giving you a brief rundown of what I'm going to talk about in our presentation. Uh, I'm gonna begin with a brief introduction of our department. And then we're gonna talk about licensing, registration, training, notification, and record keeping requirements. Basically, I'm gonna cover the boring stuff. Um, this is all stuff that's kind of like on the back end outside of actual pesticide applications, but it's still really important because it does lead to violations and it causes headaches and we don't want you guys running into trouble. Um, after that, Henderson is gonna cover uh, safety requirements relating to PPE selection, medical care, decontamination, pesticide storage, the actual sort of meat of what you guys do with pesticides. But again, paperwork's important, so let's get to it. So the San Diego County Department of Agriculture Weights and Measures has a number of programs ranging from plant health and pest prevention and nurseries to consumer protection in grocery stores and gas stations. Uh, most relevant to us today is the Pesticide Regulation Program. Uh, we conduct inspections of pest control operations. We investigate pesticide illnesses, um, complaints. We conduct outreach like we're doing here today. And if you ever have any questions about pesticide laws and regulations, uh, you can reach the pesticide regulation program by phone or email. If you're based outside of San Diego County, uh, you can reach out to the ag commissioner of the county that you're based in. 
So let's get into it. When a business uses pesticides in California, they have certain responsibilities that they have to meet before they even start working, and then things they have to do after an application is made. That's what we're going to go over. So first, any business that applies pesticides for hire must be licensed. Uh, there are exemptions, but they're few and far between. If applying pesticides is a regular part of your work and it's not just incidental to your regular work, then you need a business license. An example of pesticide use that's incidental to primary work would be, say, the application of disinfectants to wounds on trees by tree surgeons. Uh, they're getting paid for the tree trimming and not for controlling the microbes. They just have to use the disinfectants to avoid causing harm to the tree. So it's necessary, it's incidental, but again, they're not billing for, you know, controlling microbes, they're billing for trimming a tree. Your business also has to be registered with the Ag Commissioner in any county where you apply pesticides. This registration has to be renewed annually. It's easy, it's just a form and a fee. We do this so that we know who's doing work in our respective counties. Uh, basically so we can say, oh, you know, something went wrong over here. Somebody's reporting a pesticide issue. Okay, who's registered to do this kind of application? Who submitted use reports? Let's see what might've caused this. Your business needs a qualified person supervising pesticide applications. This doesn't mean they necessarily need to be on site anytime that a pesticide is used. It means they're responsible for making sure handlers are trained, PPE is supplied, and pesticide applications are made safely. This person must have a QAL or a QAC that's issued by the California Department of Pesticide Regulation. The category or categories on their license must cover the type of work that they're supervising. A combination of two individual's licenses can satisfy this requirement if you're doing two different kinds of work, but each person only has, say, one category on their license. I've included a QR code on this slide. Uh, feel free to open it up on your phones. It links to a CDPR page discussing some upcoming changes to, among other things, uh, licensing categories. Uh, one big change is that they're now actually going to be formally defined with more than just the titles you see here, which is kind of a godsend for us because every time somebody asks us, well, what does this category cover? Say category B. Oh, it covers landscape maintenance and pest control. Not that that's actually defined anywhere in the code. Now it's going to be section uh, 6530, I believe, in Title Three of the California Code of Regulations. So check that QR code. Uh, if you want it later, feel free to uh, email one of the organizers and they can get it from us. All right. All employees who handle pesticides must be trained in pesticide safety for each type of pesticide or chemically similar group of pesticides that they will be handling. This training must occur before the employee is allowed to handle pesticides and must be repeated annually thereafter. If an employee holds a QAL or a QAC, like we mentioned before for the qualifiers, uh, they're considered trained automatically. So they don't need training. It's still a good idea to do it, um, you know, even just for the sake of having them in the class with everyone else. The exact requirements of this training are described in Title III California Code of Regulations, Section 6724. If you want training templates, you can feel free to contact our office. We have some of those. All of your training records must be maintained for two years and they must be made available to your employees. I do recommend keeping them for longer just as kind of a cover yourself measure. And by the way, if you're taking notes, uh, I recommend just uh, copying down the code sections that you see on each slide. It's gonna be a lot easier than uh, trying to copy down all the information and the code sections are obviously much more thorough. If you read a code section and you're confused by it, reach out. We're always happy to answer questions. Now, when I said an employee who handles pesticides, what does that mean? Um, so a handler, somebody who handles pesticides is anyone who applies pesticides, but it's also anyone who mixes pesticides, assists in applications, handles open pesticide containers, even someone who repairs application equipment. Because these people all have the potential to come into contact with pesticides, they're all considered to be handlers and they all must be given the same safety training. And again, it has to be done annually. So even if you have a guy who only say uh, repairs a spray rig or um, even a guy like in the circle who's just holding a hose, they're handlers, they have to be trained. 
Now, in addition to handler training, if you're going to use something that requires a respirator, you have to abide by respiratory protection requirements. These are a little more nuanced. Your requirements are going to depend on whether you use pesticides that require a respirator, what types of respirators you use, whether you allow respirators to be used voluntarily when they're not required by a label or a permit condition, and whether you provide voluntary use respirators to your employees. Uh, depending on those factors, you may be required to do ad additional training, medical evaluations, fit testing, and hazard communication posting. This is the longest code section that we enforce. We highly recommend that you contact your county ag office if you're unsure about your specific requirements. But here's a short ex explanation of a likely scenario. Say you're using a product that requires an elastomeric respirator. That's like the uh, fourth one that you see from the left with the pink cartridges on it. Uh, any employee who will be handling the product that requires that elastomeric respirator has to be medically evaluated by a physician to determine whether they're healthy enough to wear a respirator, as well as what kind they can wear and for how long. They have to be fit tested every year with the type of respirator that they're going to be using. They also have to be trained annually on the capabilities, limitations, maintenance, and proper use of a respirator as laid out in that code section 3 CCR 6739. And finally, uh, respirators that they use when handling a product must be provided at no cost by the employer, just like any other PPE. And again, long code section. If you read it, you're confused, just reach out to us. Now, a common, very easily avoidable violation that we tend to see is a failure to post the N8 or the A8, uh, or a failure to fill it out. So this is a page from the Pesticide Safety Information Series. It's published by CDPR, and it should be part of your training program. Now, whether you perform agricultural or non-agricultural work will determine which sheet you need. Filling it out is easy. You're basically just putting down where to seek medical attention in the event of pesticide exposure and where to find pesticide records like those training records we mentioned before. If that information changes, make sure you update the sheet within 24 hours. And yet again, more paperwork. You may need a written recommendation before you spray. This is a document explaining what to apply to control a specific pest at a specific site and detailing possible hazards to be aware of. A recommendation from a licensed pest control advisor is required anytime you apply pesticides on land owned by a public agency. This includes places like parks and golf courses, public golf courses that is, not private ones. Any application of a restricted material on a private non-production ag site, such as a private golf course, also requires a PCA recommendation. And when I say restricted material, um, I mean a California restricted material, which we're gonna go over later. Applications on private production ag sites, so like nurseries, farms, uh, those require a recommendation written by either the owner of the property or by a licensed PCA. And yet again, more to do before you even spray. Before you apply pesticides, the operator of a property must provide the following information to anyone who is on the property, property to be treated or who may enter the property during the application or while an REI is in effect. That's a restricted entry interval. Everyone should know what that is. They have to let them know what's being applied, when it's being applied, where it's being applied, and what they should do to stay safe. This could mean instructing them not to enter an area. There's no specific deadline or format for providing this information. You don't even have to give it in writing. It can be verbal. It simply has to be provided in a manner that the person receiving it understands, and it has to be given far enough ahead of time that they can take appropriate precautions. And note, a a business hired to perform pest control is only responsible for notifying the property operator. The property operator must assure that the notice is forwarded to uh, anyone who might be like an employee or member of the public who might enter the treated property. Now here's a big one for you guys working with trees, especially next spring. when. When you're going to apply a pesticide to a flowering plant, you should always review the label for a bee box like you see here. 
there may be limitations on use during times when bees are active. And well, you may ask, when are bees active? Is it when you can see the bees, when bees are actively visiting the flowers on the tree? If a label says when bees are active, that's defined uh, in the code, section 3 CCR uh, 6980. It might be 81. It's one of those between 6980 and 6983. Bees are active. Um, well, it's easier to say when they're inactive. They're inactive one hour after sunset and two hours before sunrise. They're also inactive when the temperature is 50 degrees Fahrenheit or below. So if they're not inactive per the code section, they're considered active. You shouldn't use a pesticide that says don't use when bees are active. And if the pesticide you plan to use is toxic to bees, but it doesn't say don't apply while bees are active, you're still required to notify any apiary operator who has requested notification within one mile of the application site at least 48 hours prior to the planned application. They can't prohibit the application. They have no authority to tell you not to do it. This notice is given to allow them time to protect their bees. And there's a website called Beware that can be used to find contact information for affected apiaries. Uh, it's beware.calagpermits.org. If you want more information, again, reach out to your ag commissioner. But this is where uh, all the information that we get from apiaries requesting notification gets aggregated. All right, now after an application, you have to maintain certain records of your pesticide use. There are records you keep when, these are the records you keep when you're performing pest control for hire. Uh, if you have any questions about these requirements, um, just contact your county ag office. Uh, the records you're required to keep are again, kept in this code section. It's what you applied, where, when, operator of the property, what you treated, how much of the pesticide you used, basic information. Now, additional information has to be kept for applications and production agriculture settings. Um, it's more specific, like you have to have the MTRS, the township range based meridian um, where the site was located. You have to have the hour that the treatment was completed. That's important because of the REI duration. You need the operator ID number. Again, this is listed in the code sections. Make sure that you know what information you're required to keep. And also make sure that you know what information you're required to report. Every month that you apply pesticides, you must report the information shown to your county ag commissioner or to the county ag commissioner where you perform the work. The deadline to report is the 10th of the following month outside of production ag. So for example, uh, all of your pesticides used in August have to be reported by the 10th of September. Uh, if you apply no pesticides in a given month in a county where you're registered, you have to submit a negative use report so we know that you didn't just forget to submit a report at all. For PCB applications and production ag settings, reports are due within seven days of the application. So if you're spraying it at an orchard or something like that, seven days. Your use reports can be submitted either on paper or electronically. We highly recommend using electronic use reporting because it ensures that your reports make it to us in a timely manner and that they don't get lost in transit. Online use reporting is free and easy. You can talk to your county ag commissioner to set you up with an online account to do it. And one moment. Let's talk about restricted materials permits. I was told that some people are interested in carburetor. If you want carburetor, you're going to need a restricted materials permit. Some pesticides cannot be purchased, possessed, or used in California without a permit. These are called California restricted materials. Uh, note there's a difference between federally restricted and California restricted materials. Federally restricted materials can be purchased by any licensed or certified applicator without any kind of additional permit. A permit for California restricted materials um, is a special thing that you have to apply for with the county ag commissioner. It has to be associated with a licensed or certified applicator. The permit E is required by law to abide by all conditions of the permit. They have to submit to annual inspections. 
they have to submit a notice of intent informing the county at least 24 hours before each application of restricted material. And we can extend that. We can say you have to let us know 48 hours in advance, 72 hours in advance. You have to abide by it. It's enforceable by the same code section as the, uh, the label, uh, Food and Ag Code Section 12973. These permits are not automatically renewed. And they have to be renewed every year in order to continue using California restricted materials, even if you bought those materials while the RMP was valid. Um, now I say every year, some counties do issue them for longer than that. San Diego County, we never issue a permit for longer than a year. We wanna make sure that we keep an eye on you that we're getting those annual inspections, but some counties might give you two, maybe even three years, but not us. And finally, like I said, I wanna talk briefly about a specific restricted material that I heard some of you might be interested in. Carburetal requires a restricted materials permit. What determines whether a material is, a, whether a pesticide is a California restricted material is the active ingredient. So anything containing carburetal, automatically California restricted. The conditions that we set in San Diego County for carburetal are mostly related to pollinator protection. But you should also be aware that this chemical is a cholinesterase inhibitor. It can damage your central nervous system if you're not careful. And if you're using a warning or a danger product that contains carbaryl in a production ag setting, like in an orchard, uh, you'll need a medical supervision program to monitor cholinesterase levels in handler's blood. Um, this is to make sure that uh, it's not accumulating in their blood, that their colon that their cholinesterase levels aren't dropping because that again affects the central nervous system. It can lead to some pretty bad effects. Uh, some products also require respiratory protection. Like I mentioned before, those requirements are pretty nuanced, more nuanced than we have time to discuss today. Reach out to your local ag commissioner for more information on respiratory protection and medical supervision if this applies to you. And with that, that's all the boring stuff out of the way. We can get into the uh, actual requirements during an application. Henderson, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. Um, my name is Henderson. I work for the County of San Diego as a pesticide inspector alongside Brian. I've been working for about two years now. And uh, yeah, let me, let's just get this started. I'm sure you guys have been here for quite a while. So let's just wrap this up. Let me uh, screen share real quick and we can get started. Perfect. All right. So today I'm just going to be talking about safety during applications. So this is uh, when you guys are out in the field and you are going to be you know, applying pesticides or mixing loading, that kind of stuff. Um, I'm just going to be the inspector coming by, hey, let's do an inspection. And you're asking, what are we looking for, Henderson? And I'm like, all right, this is what we're looking for. We'll just go through this with you. So First thing I usually ask is, you know, when I see someone doing a, an a application or something like that, I ask them, hey, can I see the label? Label is basically just like a little instruction guideline. It basically just tells you like, you know, what you are applying. Is it caution, warning, danger product? What kind of PPE do you need to wear? Um, what can you apply to? Is it for non-ag or is it for structural? Um, it's just dependent on all that, you know? So I just make sure that you're actually following the label because after all, the label is the law and applies to everybody. Later on, we're gonna be talking about some regulations um, that apply to only employees, but um, whether you're an employee or an employer or owner in the situation, you will have to follow the label. So all of this is enforceable. You know, it might even talk about like some time restrictions. I know for like example, Termidor, um, SC, uh, termiticide, insecticide can only be used at certain times of the year or something like that. Um, we, we look at all those restrictions and we, uh, we're just basically there to make sure that everything is being followed to the letter. And uh, if you ever have any questions about like how to apply certain pesticide, um, you can always just look back at the label. Um, you can always go below the label rate that's stated on the label, and you can go at the same rate as the, what the label states. You just can't go over. All right. So let's move on to regulation PPE. So this is 
pertaining to all employees who handle pesticides. They have to follow, uh, wear the following PPE, even if it's not listed on the label. So the two main things that we look for are chemical resistant gloves and protective eyewear. So any employee working for a company, if they're you know, mixing or loading, uh, applying pesticides, that kind of thing, we are looking for these two main things. Um, if you are using a warning or danger product, uh, pesticides are a little more severe, we're gonna be looking for coveralls. But the main two things are just the gloves and the eyewear. So, all right. So what kind of eyewear can I wear, Henderson? I'm always looking for the NZZ87.1 uh, marking. So this is a little marking that will usually be on, I think the, the, uh, the side of, you know, where the, the earpiece of the eyewear. And um, just, you can pull off your glasses, take a look. If it's not there and it's not NZZ87, but this is the marking that we go for. And this is the marking that, you know, DPR goes by. And this is just basically what we look for because it's determined that, you know, has brow protection and will protect you um, in the case of a pesticide accident. You know, in case like, you know, you're mixing loading, you, you dump a little bit too much water and splashes back in your face. This is going to help you avoid most of that splash. So one thing that we always want to make sure our employers should actually make sure that their employees can wear these, this, um, these protective uh, eyewear. What's the use of protective eyewear if your employer uh, employees never use it? After all, um, you know, some of us, you know, were uh, challenged like uh, visually. So <laughs> we have to wear um, what is it, corrective lenses and all that stuff. Not everyone can wear contacts. So you have to make sure that your employees have protective eyewear that fits over the glasses. And yeah, one other thing that I always see, and I actually seen a couple of violations this way, is that some people, you know, when they're driving, especially if it's hot summer, you know, San, like San Diego day, it's sunny. You're going to want to wear sunglasses, but sometimes, you know, you forget to switch them out when you're doing the applications and sometimes you're rushing, you just forget to switch back. Um, I would say to the employers, hey, think about getting those sunglass safety glasses because it's, it's a, maybe it's a little more expensive to get those, but it sure beats, you know, like a $500 fine, you know? So yeah, an employer has to provide protective, protective eyewear to an employee who applies or handles pesticides. So employers, you guys are responsible for providing your employees and protecting them. Um, yeah, selection of gloves. So gloves have to be at least 14 mil thick. That's kind of what we go by. And unless they're made from barrier laminate or polyethylene. And that's basically what we're looking for. You can use disposable nitrile gloves. There's a specific exemption for that. And that's only, that's only in the case though, for using tasks requiring fine manual dexterity. So, you know, this might be something like, for example, you're working with bait stations. You got to jam the key in there, fiddle around with the bait and, you know, replace it on that kind of stuff. That's just an example. Um, yeah, you can use your nitrile gloves, but after 15 minutes, you want to get rid of them. Those gloves will not last. You can either put a new pair on or, you know, you switch to your regular chemical resistant gloves or just be done. So, yeah, there's that. Coveralls. When you're using a warning or danger product, employees must wear coveralls. So this can be like one to two piece thing and it just covers your entire body except for your head, hands, and feet. Again, this is like usually what you would see as a uniform uh, provided by the employer. And usually most uniforms would be long sleeve shirts and long pants. And it's kind of an extra way to help keep you guys safe. You know, if something does happen, you spill a little bit of um, pesticide on yourself. Um, this is going to help act as an extra barrier to your body. Emergency medical care. So I'm out. Um, this, this has to be posted at every work site or work vehicle. Most commonly, most of you guys will probably be working out of your vehicles. Um, and this is just something that we, it's, it's important for you guys to have this here. They have to have these three elements. They have to have the name of the medical center. They have to have the address and the phone number. 
And the reason why we ask for this is because, you know, not every single medical center is equipped to deal with a pesticide related incident. Um, if something does happen to you, we want to make sure that, you know, the proper authorities, um, your uh, fellow employees know where to take you. Or if, yeah, they, they, it would kind of suck, you know, if you swallowed, I don't know, a bottle of um, Taurus or something like that, and you're throwing up, you're not feeling so good, they take you to a hospital, oh, the wrong one, let's go to the next one, that's like 20 minutes away. It's just kind of there to protect you. So employees must be taken to a physician immediately by someone else if pesticide symptoms develop or may develop. And the reason behind this is that you're sick, you're poisoned, you might feel worse. You know, it might feel okay now, like but five minutes later, you want to be throwing up and crashing to like uh, the side of a dish of a road. So this is just to, you know, help keep you safe. Decontamination facility. All right. So a lot of these requirements that I'm talking about today is just really, they're kind of a prep to like, uh, in case something does happen, you want to have these things like ready to go. So this is just talking about soap, water, single use towels, and a change of coveralls. And this is usually with when you guys are using warning or danger products. So this is like usually a kit that you'd keep in your vehicle and yeah. Hand sanitizer doesn't meet the requirement. You might think, oh, it's soap and water mixed in one, right? Nah, it just sanitizes. It doesn't actually wash away the pesticide. So this is just something that we want to, it's just, it's, it's just, just carry soap and water and single use towels. Um, that's gonna be the thing that helps get rid of the pesticide off your skin um, and away from you. All right. Pesticide storage. So pesticides must be locked if it unattended or attended to at all times. So if you're in your truck and for example, you're a structural business or something like that, you're just in front of the house filling up your backpack sprayer. Um, if you can still see your truck, that's totally fine. You know, you're still attending to it. You can see it. You can tell if someone's like, you know, act, acting, acting a little sketchy around your truck. You tell them, hey, shoo, shoo, go away. But if you're going around to the backyard or something like that, and you can't see the vehicle, you can't get to it immediately. That's not being attended to. Just, just lock it up. And if warning and danger products are stored, the storage area must be posted similar to this. So this is usually back at your office. You see a danger poison storage area, this kind of sign. So this is what we look for. Um, whether it's on your truck or whether it's, you know, out in the field uh, um, or it's going to be at your office, whatever you uh, store these products. All right. One more thing that we look for is we look for proper containers. So these are just, we want to make sure that you guys are not reusing coffee cans, Gatorade bottles, um, water bottles, you know, we want to make sure that no pesticides are being placed in this. Because a very common thing that we see in our investigations is, I think remember like this year, uh, uh, some girl uh, went to sleep, like um, put some bleach in a water and a, a little water bottle. And she was like, okay, I'm gonna use this for cleaning. And left it next to her bed. She woke up and it's like, oh, water drink it straight to the hospital. We were trying to stop that from happening. So any common food drink containers or labels ripped off, it's still considered improper because it's very easy to mistake it for, you know, just that common food product. And yeah, there's a little exemption uh, for non-pesticide bait products like peanut butter. You guys are trying to, you know, use it for bait stations. You can still use it. You just got to rip off the labeling and, specifically state on it, you can write on it and just say bait or for pesticide use, similar wording, that kind of thing. All right, and our last one, um, let's talk about service container labeling. So you guys are at the office and you guys are mixing, loading and putting some pesticides that you just mixed into a backpack sprayer. Cool, that works perfect. Um, but we got to know what kind of pesticide is actually in there. Um, it's, we got to know. 
So these are the four things that have to be listed on that little um, kit right there. So you have to write the name of the person or business responsible for the container, the address, the identity, the signal word of the pesticide as well. And if you notice that this label is missing something, you are always more than welcome to write that missing information on the backpack sprayer or on the you know, container that you're keeping it in or on this tag too, because um, we need to know uh, what you guys actually have in that actual container, because otherwise without it, no one would know. You could say, hey, I know what, what I put in there uh, this morning, but you might have put it like suspend, but it might be, you know, termidor instead. So we need to have this labeling and it's just really there to let us know what's happening. And yeah, I think that's about it. I'm kind of uh, blowing through this. I know you guys are a little antsy to get out of here, but in the end, <laughs> all of this is, um, yeah, like with Brian and I, what we really aim to do is just, this is safety in the end. We want to pre help prevent you guys from getting hurt. Um, and, you know, we want to uh, prevent other people from getting hurt and also keep the environment safe as well. And in the end, you guys have any questions about any regulations that may or may not pertain to you, don't be afraid to reach out to the ag, um, the county ag. We are here to help and we love it when you know companies preemptively like, hey, I ran into this weird situation. Just, just reach out to us, uh, us. You know, if we don't know it, we'll find out for you, and we'll try our best to help you out. So, if Brian doesn't have anything else to add, um, I think that would be about it. Super. I think it's a short quiz, actually, but that's yeah, it. Dude. Super, thanks, Brian and Henderson. Really appreciated you running through all that. I know it's not always the most exciting information, but very, very important. Um, we'll have a couple more um, poll questions. I do have a question in the Q&A for you. So Heidi, if you can run those poll questions, please. Yeah, I just want the first one. Great. And then as you're um, finishing this up and pulling up the results, I want to remind everyone that our feedback survey quiz, Heidi posted to the chat a little bit ago. Uh, maybe we can get that reposted again to chat here in a minute. Mm -hmm. And then she also recently um, posted the link to this quiz survey if you are interested in um, obtaining continuing education units. Thank you. Is there one more? One more. And there it is. So I was just reading, I'm I'm sorry, I think there was some confusion about the end time for the webinar um yeah we were always our agenda always was scheduled to go through 4 30 so apologies to anyone who was expecting to get done earlier um okay and category the e is the correct one for this okay great oh okay yeah okay and then I also posted the link for the CEU quiz if you're seeking to obtain CEUs. Also in the chat, I can repost it. Um, yes, and if you could repost the uh, feedback survey, um, that's really Im important. If you could please just take a, a minute and complete that survey um, for your feedback, it's anonymous. And, um, you know, we're required to report impact for all of our outreach activities. And we're also um, use your comments and input to um, help us maintain our programs um, imp and improve them. So your input is vital. Thank you in advance for doing that. Um, a quick question um, for uh, Brian and Henderson. You said that if you do not use any pesticides, then you still have to report a non-use report. 
However, your slide said that if you didn't use any during a month, then you are not required to file a report, which is it. So there's some uh, confusion over that. That's my bad. That was meant for, um, I, I reused a slide for growers. If, if you're a pest control business, um, you do have to submit a negative use report. If you're a grower, if you're applying pesticides on your own property, you do not need to submit a negative use report. Okay. You only need to submit a negative use report if you're a business that's registered in a county where you didn't perform work that month. Okay. Apologies. Okay, great. Thank you for clearing that up. And I don't see any other questions specific um, to that. If anyone else has a question, please, we've got another minute. Please pop it into the Q&A. Oh, here's one more. What if you are a commercial landscaper? I'm not sure what the question is. So if a commercial you, landscaper. Report, yeah. So um, commercial landscapers, there's a special type of license called a maintenance gardener business license issued by the California Department of Pesticide Regulation. Uh, the requirements are a little less stringent. Uh, it's easier to qualify for it. It's basically for businesses that are applying pesticides in conjunction with their landscaping activities. Uh, you need that license unless you're applying pesticides to control a pest on newly installed landscaping that you put in less than a year ago. And the reason for that is, um, you know, a lot of the time landscapers offer a one year guarantee on any newly planted uh, landscaping. So they're considered to have sort of like an ownership stake in that. You don't need a license if you're only doing that. But if you're spraying Roundup for weeds, you need that maintenance gardener business license. Ryan, I think he's talking about the uh, previous question as well, because he was the person who talked about the oh the negative use report. Negative use uh, report. Yes. Yeah. You still have to report every month and submit a negative use report if you don't apply anything. And also, I saw a question from someone who uh, was asking about um, like compost teas or things like that. Uh, fertilizers are not reportable as pesticides unless they're like a weed and feed that has a pesticidal component to them. Uh, you don't have to report them and you don't need a license to apply them. All right, great. Thank you. A really um, great show from everybody. We thank all of our presenters today. We thank all of you for being here. We're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Um, again, we have the feedback evaluation survey and we have the survey if you're interested in obtaining continuing education units. Um, certificates of participation, whether you need it or not, <laughs> for whatever reason, will be emailed, um, I would say probably, you know, soon. And that email will also contain information regarding um, the availability of the rec this recording and um, your certificate of participation will include the codes, the course codes for CEUs and um, any other information um, relevant to this webinar be, will be shared in that um, follow-up email to all of you. So thank you again for joining us. We're going to go ahead and stop recording and close things up now. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Heidi. Um, and her email is um, tied to, I'm sure, one of the reminder emails that you received previously.